Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming in. God bless you all. Today we'll be talking about um, the future church leadership. Um, I just want to upload my slides quickly so we know what we're doing. So briefly, I'm just going to be touching on the need of leadership. Why do we need leadership? Um, sorry, you're using the wrong slide. Sorry about this, just a little bit of technical issues. Going to the first slide. Why do we need leadership? Why do you think you and I need leadership? Without leadership, there will be lawlessness, confusion, and also without leadership, people are as sheep without a shepherd, and without strong and godly leadership, weak leaders control. There was no leadership in Israel, and the result was that every man did what they wanted and which was right in their eyes. Nimrod was the rebel leader in the building of the Tower of Babel. In the end, God dealt with Nimrod and brought confusion of tongues and scattered the people. God's people are likened to sheep and their leaders likened to shepherds. Sheep require leadership, as do the people of God. God's people are likened to sheep and their leaders likened to shepherds. Like I said, sheep require leadership as do, as do the people of God. Without strong and godly leadership, weak and immature leaders will control people. Time and time again in history and in recent times, as man has shown that regardless of the type of leader, for example, um, President Trump, you no, know, Boris Johnson, and sorry to say, our President Buhari of the world, they will still have people that will follow them. The scripture and history indeed showed the need for leadership, but also the necessity for godly and Christ like leadership. In the book of Joshua 24, after leading his people into a new land, Joshua offered the Israelites the option either to serve God, who, they, who, who had always served and the one who brought them into the land, or to serve the God of their surroundings. But as for me and my house, he says, we will serve the Lord. The people answered in unison that they would pledge their allegiance to God because they believed in Joshua's leadership. They followed Joshua's example. He did not have to threaten them. He merely inspired them by, the, by his example. Moving on, um, just the three types of leadership that I managed to look at. Home leadership, national leadership, and church leadership. In a home, there must be leadership. Children should not lead or control their parents. There must be divine order, otherwise the home will be disintegrated, and which is what is happening in today's life. If we look at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, it tells us that children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long in the land. Verse 4 also says, uh, for our parents, fathers do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instructions of the Lord. The world around us today shows us how nations rise and fall with or without leadership. All nations of antiquity, as well as modern nations, rise to power and fall to ruin according to leadership. 
in the body of Christ, God has sent apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, pastors, as well as governing elders as earthly as, as an earthly institution to govern and guide his people. A church without leadership is like a plane full of passengers without a pilot. Remember, God is the supreme leader and guide of all his creation. But in relation to earth, God has delegated authority to leaders in the home, in the nations, and in the church. All therefore are accountable to him and him alone. Moving on to the three kinds of biblical leaders, self-appointed, man-appointed, and God-appointed. I wouldn't deliberate much on them because everything that I wanted to say, you can read from the slide, saying Korah was self-appointed, revolting against Moses and Aaron, and which was dangerous and brought judgment to Israel. We can see in the Bible that back in the Bible, the people asked for a king. And Saul was appointed. And we can see for the time that Saul was king, so many calamities happened. What happened when a God-appointed leader gets into um, place? What I wrote was, Joseph was appointed by God. His story began in Genesis 37. Joseph became the leader of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh himself. While there was famine, he was also able to save his family from starvation. God orchestrated the events to put Joseph in position to save them. One thing that I do know about leaders is that leaders should have a vision that sustained them through the difficult times. Lastly, think and think well as a current leader or future leader. Are you self-appointed, man-appointed, or God-appointed? Are you self-appointed, man-appointed, or God-appointed? Moving on now, we'll be having the opening prayer, when, which after my prophet and Kilolu will be taking over. God bless you. Jehovah, Jesus Christ, Holy Michael, dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day. We thank you, God, because you grant us worthy to be alive. God, we thank you because it's by your grace that we are here today, nor is it by our might. Father, all glory belongs to your name. God, we are asking you, we are asking you to take control of this program in the mighty name of Jesus. We are begging you, the King of glory, to descend into our midst and take control of this program in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we are begging you to come and sanctify our hearts and our minds and our souls so we are able to accept the word that will be preached to us in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we are asking you that every spirit of doubt or confusion in our mind that will not allow us to be able to absorb the information that will be given to us today, Father, I'm asking you to remove it away from our hearts. Father, I'm asking you to prepare our minds and our hearts and, and open it up so we are able to, to be able to contain all the fruitful information that, will, that we will be taught today in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, God, because you are good. Thank you, God, because you have never left us alone. Thank you, God, because you are the only true and living God, and there is none like you, and there will never be none like you. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for answering our prayers in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. Um, once again, I say good evening and welcome my mothers and my fathers, my brothers and my sisters to this wonderful seminar. Um, we thank the convener of the program and this in person of Prophet Emmanuel Shomuiwa. We thank you for putting such a brave and highly controversial topic in place so that we can learn at the feet of Jesus. Um, it's a program that has been pulled in by the disciples in Christ. 
And the theme for today is sitting on the church future leadership. And as you've heard so far from the convener, particularly, I like there's a particular phrase that he used. He said, we cannot be like a plane filled with passengers without a pilot. Um, if we look at the theme itself, which is church future leadership, New Testament is filled with instructions in discipling believers generally. But the focus of raising up church leaders in particular, Apostle Paul tells Titus that it is when I left you in Crete so that you might put what remain into order. If you appoint elders in every town as I've directed you, then he described that what these elders should be like. And he said to Timothy, in quotes, faithful men who will be able to teach others. In the same way, likewise, we sit on the council of Apostle Paul in how to work out our leaders, encourage them, and raise leaders for our churches for tomorrow. So in serving, or eventually serving within the ministry of God, many of those matters will be put to light tonight. And broadly, it will be based on discipline and how to raise future leaders within the Christendom. It is not particularly directed to a particular set of church, but it's a broad world talk whereby we can see how to disciple a believer and how would a would-be church leader would be created or molded in the line of God. Tonight, I bring into your, into your hearing we have four speakers. The first speaker that we have tonight is in person of our prophet, leader, a man full of God's passion, a man that has been ordained in the ministry of God. His name is Special Apostle Prophet Yomi Odunaya. Prophet Yomi Odunaya has played an active role in the decision of the CMSC, which is the Cherubim and Seraphim Church World World. Prophet Odunaya has served in the National Evangelical Committee under Special Apostle Omolabe. Senior uh, Prophet Odunaya is, uh, is involved in evangelical activities around the UK. Republic of Ireland and the United States of America. Prophet Odunaya was appointed as chairman and board for missions and church planting in 2017 by the conference and currently champions a global initiative that supports the interdenominational Bible studies here in the UK. He belongs to several Christian associations. This encourages us that the impact of the knowledge that will be impacted by our father, Prophet Odunaya, will be very varied in terms of his intercession within the ministry of God. Secondly, I would introduce the second speaker, who is in person of Pastor Mike Ajayi. Pastor Mike Ajayi is an educationist by excellence a teacher of undiluted word of God and a prophet by divine calling. He has to his credit several academic qualifications in diverse fields and has contributed immensely to the development of humanity and various positions which he had occupied as well. Pastor Ajayi is the shepherd and church administrator of the new covenant modern Christ, Cherubim and Seraphim Movement Church. Ayonio Ikorodu, Lagos, Nigeria. He is happily married to prophetess Nike Ajayi, a prophetess by virtue, a prophetess by anointing, and they are blessed with three wonderful children. Also, I am going to bring to light 
Apostle, uh, Pastor, uh, uh, Pastor M. Ajayi is the author of the book on dreams. Pastor Ajayi is a man of the word, a man of letters, a proness, is proness and is constantly, constantly updating himself to be fully equipped and efficient to declare and discharge God's mandate. He has attended several leadership courses taken as the Church Management Consult, Church Administration Society of Nigeria, Daystar Leadership Academy, and other places such as Bangkok University. Second, thirdly, I bring to you the third speaker in person of Pastor Yomi Odukoya. Pastor Yomi Odukoya is a pastor an IT professional, a speaker, a coach, a facilitator, an author with a focus on establish, establishing a new culture of leadership. All this is based on the principles of God's kingdom. His messages encourage strong personal and professional principles, including faith, respect, and service. Pastor Yomi Odukoya is the lead pastor at the Christ United Ministry International UK headquarters in Leithen, London. He is also a youth minister with many years of ministry experience dedicated to mentoring, developing young people across the UK, Southeast and the Midlands, preparing them for challenge of being the change makers of their generation. Pastor Yomi is the author of A Keep to Emerge, a book that focuses on the character, behavior, lifestyle, and mindset of leaders who might emerge to deliver a change to provide stability required in today's economy and social, cultural, and political reality. The third speaker is our pastor, Pastor Kule Fakile. Pastor Kule Fakile is a pastor by virtue. Pastor Fakile is currently a member of the CNS New Covenant Church, United Kingdom. Pastor Adekule Fakile as is well known. Apologies, everybody, just a few technical issues with Zoom at the moment, just a second. I'm sorry for the technical failure, and it was just a glitch in my PC. I was introducing the fourth speaker which is Pastor Adepule Fakile. He's a qualified mechanical engineer and a qualified radio, radiation protection consultant. He's an experienced system engineer and security consultant with hands-on experience in designing and commissioning, decommissioning, maintenance, and support of security systems. His attitude is focused on business process management consumer relationship management. Pastor Fakile has work, worked ex extensively in the UK as a company director, 
a service provider for over 25 years. It has vast hands-on experience in securing network infrastructure to, to monitor and track abuse of resources and audit. It has also delivered various solutions on security systems in Nigeria, Ghana, Rwanda, Kingali International Airport, leading and delivering small to medium-sized projects as a contractor and consultant. Above all, Pastor Fakile is also the pastor and teacher of the gospel. He has a vast leadership experience in different spiritual and doctrinal contests. He is a qualified theologian, a Christian counselor, a member of the John Maxwell leadership team, and a heart for serving humanity. He has skills in conflict management, meditation, and resolution. And currently, he runs a program called the World Bearers, whereby he gathers men and women of God in teaching under his feet on Saturday's evening. So I bring to light these four powerful men to convey the program for today. And under the leadership of the first speaker, we will have our pastor Yomi Odunaya to please introduce himself and carry on, and carry on with the discourse of tonight. I believe that we're going to be so much empowered by these men of God. And may tonight be a fulfilling night for us all in Jesus' name. Thank you. Pastor Dunaya, please. Good evening, yeah. sir. How are you? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wow. <laughs> this is interesting. Uh, well, I want to, you know, formally... Um, appreciate the honor of coming in to share my views on the subject that we're talking on tonight. Um, just a minute, please give me a minute. Let me try and share my screen. I was just going to try to share my screen. Hello. Can you am I can you yes, see sir. my screen? Yes, sir, we can see you. You yes, can. Sir. Yes, sir, we can, we can see. Okay, good. Now, um, evening, everybody. I mean, it is indeed an honor to be asked to come over and talk um, on the subject of the church future leadership. Now, um, I want to just uh, quickly do an overview of this, after which I will run through um, what I have here. Incidentally, I couldn't hold the slides, like I said, to brother Emmanuel earlier on in the day, but I will try to do justice to this within the time allotted. Um, the overview said the church may be in bondage to certain unscriptural traditions and may refuse to remain current. This is the way we have been doing things and we cannot change. Now I'm talking about where Leadership are used to certain ways of doing things, certain ways of doing things, and are not prepared to adopt new proven methods that work better, even if the old methods does not bring success. Now, Rick Warren made this comment. In the tradition-driven church, you know, the favorite phrase is, we've always done it this way. Now, the goal of a tradition-driven church is to simply perpetuate the past. Now, change is almost always seen as negative. We're talking about change, then it's almost seen as negative. And stagnation is interpreted as stability. Now, by tradition, we mean some opinions and principles that have transmitted from one generation to the other. 
Now, one of the ways to access whether or not the church is maturing spiritually is if the standards for leadership keep getting tougher. As time passes, requiring a deeper level of commitment to Christ and spiritual growth. Now, focus on raising the commitment of your leadership, not those who are, you know, the least committed in your crowd whenever you raise the standard of commitment for those who are not in most visible position of leadership. It raises the expectation of everyone else. Where are we today? I'm talking about, you know, this is very important, especially considering the post-COVID um, experience that we all have, you know, looking at where we were and where we are today. It's interesting to see that today many people have lost confidence in most of the church leadership. And then um, this is why I felt, okay, what will I be doing? I mean, if I'm asked to come in to talk about future leadership, shouldn't I first um, see where we were? That is, let's talk about the church leadership yesterday and then what is it about it, you know, today? I said leaders were selected by prayers and fasting. That was yesterday, okay? But today, what do you have? Leaders were elected by, you know, canvassing and bribing. Because we need to appreciate the fact that we just didn't get to this point by accident. Okay? Now, yesterday you have church leaders, you know, and I mean, you have churches that were multiplying. But today you have churches that are dividing, breaking away. That's what you have based on diverse opinions, diverse views, you know, leadership just being unnecessarily, you know, autocratic and insensitive, you have a lot of divisions. The dynam the, I mean, today, the dynamics of the spirit was primarily requisite um, requirement for the ministry. But look at it today. A degree from seminary is the basic qualification for assessing church leadership. In the past, the ministers had no titles. Ministers had no titles or special dresses. Okay? But the demons trembles before them. Today, what do we have? We have numerous titles and diverse sacred robes, but the devils trifle with us. Yesterday, they had little gold. Leaders and the leadership of the church, they had little gold, but a lot of glory. Today, we have a lot of gold but little of glory. They were, you know, like I said, even the deacons had to be full of the spirit then serving in the church. But today, some pastors are not even born of the spirit. The apostles refused to leave prayer and preaching yesterday. But today, pastors and preachers cleave to administration and business matters. There's a clear difference between the church yesterday. There's a clear difference between the church yesterday and the church of today. Now, the church of yesterday was based on truth, purity, and holiness. This is now hard to find in today's church. For example, looking at Nigeria, and in fact, all over the world today, there are far more people behind the pulpit that have no right to be there than there are those who have truly been called by God and do have the right to be there. 
the pulpits today are filled with men and women who are involved in all manner of immorality and perversity. Those who are involved in adultery, those who are who, who defraud their congregations, stealing money from their own churches, and those who are preaching false and demonic doctrines. In fact, in all honesty, you can't teach what you don't know. Churches today have almost become another legal tender, and some are beginning to even will say to their children and family members in the event of death and so on and so forth. So church leadership helps to set the target, the pace and the culture within the church. This valuable group of leaders are crucial to a ministry's ability to achieve its mission. Every church has a slightly different leadership model and terms for describing their, leader, their, their, their leaders. However, the basic characteristics of a church leader should be the same. Therefore, when selecting a, I mean, leaders within your church, ask these questions to determine if they are fit to lead your church mission. One, you need to ask, are they committed to the mission of the church? Are they committed to the mission of the church? Anyone in a church leadership position should demonstrate his or a commitment to the church by supporting every aspect of the ministry. For instance, does this person participate in the church event activities and, you know, discipleship opportunities? Because the Bible in the book of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 35, says, in all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Are people not just generally, generally, you know, Pursuing after personal agendas, you know, just, you know, chasing positions, their inordinate ambitions, and just perfecting their greed over the con congregation. Men today, you see, are able to pay a fortune just to be ordained for titles and for positions in the church. This is such a shame. And as you can see why today miracles no longer abound in our ministries. Two, so you must ask the question, do they demonstrate godly character in every area of their lives? Somebody we deem fit or suitable to lead, do they demonstrate godly character in every, not just in some areas or part of their living, but in every area of their lives, I can tell you, not in many, you know, churches today do you have such, you know, assessments done. Because when money talks these days, bullshit works. And because we are in such an era where leadership of the church, you know, believes in, you know, money as a means to you know, achieving a lot of projects, then you realize that some of these carnal-minded individuals have risen you know, to the top of most churches, obviously not born of the spirit. Now, church leaders need to be godly people who set the example for desired behaviors. They need to demonstrate biblical principles of communicating, decision making, and ethical behaviors in every area of their lives. Leaders need to have a high level of integrity, which is missing in the church today, and adhere to honesty, moral, and ethical principles. These behaviors should be the same across bar regardless of their situation or the people they are with. Now, listen to this 
First Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 13 is clear. It says, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? Now, my fathers and mothers in the law, men and brethren, now the question is this, how many of those in leadership today would you say have the capacity or the capability to manage their own homes, let alone the church of God? Okay, I'm sure when we get to that bridge, we'll, we'll definitely discuss this in details. Three, do they communicate effectively? Now, talking about communication, this is key. Churches rely on its leadership team to help share information and communicate with members, volunteers, and staff. This leadership communication represents the church and should be fittingly delivered and in a godly manner. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt talk, no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Is communication two ways today? Or is communication one way? In a situation whereby, you know, decisions are unilateral, definitely the communication also will be unilateral. It will be one way. Where leadership takes decision without consultation, takes decision without due following, due, due diligence is not done, due processes are not being followed. You realize that that is not definitely such leadership, that such church leadership is not for the future. And that's why whatever we are seeing today, the hesitancy of people going back to church post COVID-19 is a reflection of some of these anomalies that needs to be you know, looked into. Definitely change is required if things must improve. Number four, do they have teachable hearts? Teachable heart, teachable mentality. We are all on a journey and need to be comfortable with the fact that we are life learners. Church leaders should have a teachable heart and be open to learning new things. Now, I don't want to be seen to be assuming or making blanket statements because I know my church better than every other denomination. I'm not going to say, yes, it's a one size fits all. Right. But one thing I can tell you, having served at that level of leadership in, within my church, within my district and all that, I can tell you that quite a number of things are happening. When it, it comes to teaching, learning, I think there's still room for, you know, changes and more to be done because a situation whereby you have leadership that does not believe in learning, that just feel their years of experience or the years of ordination or the years they've been in a certain position qualifies them to perpetual monopoly of knowledge is to me madness. The, somebody dies, the day you stop learning is the day you're dead. And again, like people say, the main problem of the church today is not actually the pandemic, because a lot of us are blaming the pandemic on the stunted growth and the problem that 
churches are having today, people are no longer wanting to go. No, that is not true. The major problem of the church today is the disease called arrogance and ignorance. You see, look, the Bible says in Osea chapter 4, verse 6, that my people perish for lack of knowledge. When there is no knowledge, people suffer destruction. Because you cannot provoke the positive change, the much needed changes, except there is an entry of the word of the Lord. And this will only come through that facilitation of learning. Leadership must continue to learn. Learning must be a continuum. We must see this as, a, I mean, practically, you know, being a necessity for change, necessity for growth. If the church must grow, Assessing, assessing the growth of a church must not be based on exponential growth or numerical values. We should look at it both quantitatively and qualitatively. Saying that you can give only what you know, what you have is what you will give. But imagine somebody that believes the way he's been doing things for the past 20, 30 years is still the same way things should be done today. Come on. <laughs> There's this idea that says, well, you keep doing things the same way and you're expecting different results then most definitely somebody deserves a room at the a psychiatric home because you will not continue to do things the way you used to do it in spite of the fact that you are not recording much success, but because that is the way you've been doing it, then you believe it should continue that way. I think the church needs healing. Church leadership needs overhauling. It's important today, especially looking at the mass movement of the youth from the church then I believe church leadership needs to do a lot more to restore confidence and to build the faith of our youth members who are the leaders of the church tomorrow. Because right now it seems we're failing in that area. Now the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 10, it says, if the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the hedge, then he must use more strength. You see, look, one thing is for us to come to this platform to want to do justice to the subject of future leadership in the church. Now, we also must be able to internalize, you know, look at yourselves and carry out that, you know, critical reflection of how did you get to where you are? What's your vision? What's your mission? Are you looking forward to, you know, where do you want to be? How do you share these views? Do you have other people that, you know, Believe in your vision. How do you sell the vision? How do you get the buying in? And how do you get the followership and all that? So you realize that, look, leadership of the church should no longer be covered with all these cassocks and garments and big, 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 big titles. And, you know, but it should be something that everybody finds desirable by dint of, you know, by, by just making ourselves available to learning learning, learning the words of God, the gospel, the, 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 the job of evangelism is what should be paramount in the heart of leadership of the church. If today we want the church back where it used to be, are they flexible? Church leadership must be, must be flexible considering the, 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 the diversity. When you look at the, the kind of um, diversity you have in the church today, human needs definitely varies. And then the church must be seen or church leadership must be seen to be meeting, you know, individual needs and the corporate needs of the church must be the reason why you are bringing them together. Now, the mere nature of the church requires flexibility. Most leadership today, are, they're so rigid, so insensitive and not flexible. Now, leaders must be flexible with what the church expects of them and willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done. I mean, sometimes I wonder how leadership of the church will shut the congregation out of decision-making processes. Why? Because they believe they've arrived or because you feel you've attained a level of, um, what do you call it? I mean, you're carrying some titles or some positions or ordination that makes you untouchable, unreachable. 
you are no longer accessible, you are no longer approachable, where you don't consider that your weakest link might actually be your strongest, you know, um, source of wealth, it's important. It's such a painful thing. How we got to this point, sincerely, is, um, is, is, is still something we need to look into and then how we're going to get out of it, I pray, is the reason why we're here tonight and the Lord will, will, you know, will, lead, will lead us aright and then guide and guide our thoughts processes. Where the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verse 13. All the listen, Frank. Please hit me, and you don't want to Sorry? Okay. Please be patient. I think there's a breaking connection. Um, I think whilst we're waiting for our, our father prophet Adunaya to come back, um, I would just like to do a, a quick review why whilst we're still waiting for him and to begin and to uh, for us to have a highlight of what he's said so far. Um, I think my father has said so much that I, I think I'm losing track of. He gave so many important um, review, looking through the traditional the current um, church of today and the church of yesterday. And he spoke about the titles, the, the, the dresses, and he, he spoke about the, the differences in terms of the goals and the glories of the past, that there's little goals in the past and a lot of glory. And in today's church, we, we, look, we have so much glory, but, uh, so much uh, goals, but little glory. Also, he, he said uh, the church of the old is born of the spirit, that the church of today are not born of the spirit. And he further said that um, today's church is mainly conversing for titles and there's so much breakaway within the body of Christ. He spoke about leadership that have no controls in terms of their emotions they have no um, emotions. They're not internalized. They're not critical. There's no reflection on their mission. And they, they want to be, if you deduce what he said, that we have a lot of leadership, their masters are not servants. And that the, 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 the church of today do not have a teachable heart. And there's so much immorality joining through our churches. Also, that the leadership does not believe in learning, and a leadership without learning cannot flourish within the anointing. And he gave references of Osiah chapter six, and he, he said about the proven track records of the leadership of today, and he mirrored it to the leadership of yesterday, that we overhaul without confidence, wow. losing a lot of our youths. Um, I'm just trying to do, just keep the ball rolling before my father comes. Apologies. Um, oh, sorry, apologies. Thank you, sir. I, was, I got frozen and I didn't just know that. I mean, well, I might just call it a day, really. I didn't know that, I, I mean, I was frozen. That must be a network problem. Yes, it okay. is. It was a glitch. Welcome back, sir. Okay, so what do I do? Do, do I just close it or I leave it at, at that? Oh, you, you still have about five minutes to close, sir. That's fine. Fantastic. So where, where was I, please? Um, you got up to uh, the godly character in every areas of the lives of the leaders. Okay, so did, you, uh, did I say anything about them being team-oriented? 
No, you haven't. You didn't get to that point, sir. What about them being flexible? Yeah, um, you you got to the um, by working hand and helping the weak, which is more blessed rather to that they're better receiving than given. Oh my God, that's so so Back so far. <laughs> okay, so, well, yeah. let me just quickly let me just recap in five minutes. Now yeah. the issue here is this: Are they flexible? Are they flexible? You know, the mere nature of the church requires flexibility. Leaders must be flexible with, you know, with what the church expects of them and willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done. For the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, that uh, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for this good pleasure. Are they team oriented? Now, I said, uh, these days you realize that um, you have leadership that is not just insensitive, but again, does not have proper or deep understanding of what team building or team working is all about. Okay, a church leader needs to have great team skills and the ability to take a group of random people and transform them into a committed workforce that supports a church mission. The, these leaders operate out of win-win. Now, this is very important for me, win-win philosophy and help others come to an agreement and encourage collaboration in the task. Two are better than one, according to Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 to 10. Two are always better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. You look at it today, when you look at the structure of the church, take for, for instance the 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 the, the movement, this Sherubi Masravi movement, which is my own primary constituent, you will realize that because of the high-handedness and stiff nakedness of most of the church, the, the districts, leaders, and the, or call it the leadership now, a lot of younger, dynamic, you know, visionary leaders, young leaders, young pastors are trying to get away get away. They're trying to get away because they, they, they don't seem to have their vision aligning with that of the church anymore. And this is an area we need to look at critically because you can realize that when the same time is no longer able to hold, then definitely something is bound to happen. There's going to be a, 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 a I, I hope it's not a tsunami of, uh, of leadership. So it's important that we all try to do the needful by looking at ways of changing leadership attitude. The, 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 the mindset of our leaders should not just be to lord themselves and oppress the youth or the young, but to, to collaborate, you know, to work in hand in hand, build a team for that can that can drive a, a sustainable future for the church. Do they lead by example? Are leadership leading by example? Anyone can demonstrate leadership abilities. But consequently, if you have an active church member or volunteer who takes the initiatives and leads by example, they are probably a good candidate for your leadership. What do you have? Do you have envy? You have people, you know, leadership that, 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 that is envious of a vibrant follower or a young member of the church or a youth member thereby, you know, chasing the person out of the church instead of encouraging them and helping them to, you know, su you know sustain their vision within the church. It is very important. We got to re re review the way and manner we appoint people to leadership role. The book of 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 12 says, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity, so that when they look up to you, they know that definitely you are being led by the Holy Spirit. May the Lord continue to help the church. Are they accountable? This is another critical area of leadership of the church. Most church leadership don't want to be held accountable. They want to hold the responsibility, but they don't want to be held accountable. If you are going to be, if you are going to be sitting at the a position of leadership, then you must be accountable to the to your congregation. You must be accountable to your followers. The the the, the led must believe 
in their leaders to give accounts, to be transparent, to be open in all ramifications. So that it's not just a case of, you know, um, my way or no other way. I'm sure when it comes, when we get to the question and answer sessions, we will do justice to some of these uh, um, submissions. It Amen. does not matter who, I mean, how committed or teachable or flexible someone is, if they cannot get the job done, if you cannot be held accountable or you cannot get the job done, then definitely there's need for change. Accountability is imperative to getting things accomplished and is demonstrated by the successful completion of various assigned them responsibility. The Bible says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your, with your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10. Do they have influence within the membership? Leaders are responsible for influencing others by demonstrating a path forward. Someone in a leadership position should have relationships within the church, community, and also have, they must have had others' respect. Because the Bible says iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. According to Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17, it's important that they have influence, not just within the church, but also within the community at large. Now, finally, I want us to ask ourselves tonight, do they have the heart to serve? Because what you have presently, are they servant leaders? Are they servant leaders? Do they actually have the heart to serve? Or they have the heart to be served? Church leadership is about serving. And people appointed to positions of authority to have a servant's heart. They must have servant's heart and commitment to be part of the team that gets things done. The Bible says in Matthew 20, 26, that yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Churches need a lot of help today. And I'm closing now. I'm closing now. Churches need a lot of help today. And it, it is a natural tendency to pick the first one body when filling a leadership position because somebody is, um, is readily available and willing, you fill the role. However, taking time, let's take time now to access, to ask the questions and to determine that we have the right person for the right job. This will help us to avoid the unpleasant task of removing the wrong persons from a leadership role. God bless you all. Thank you so much for listening. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can hear you. Thank you Thank so you. much for, wow, such an in-depth teaching. And we, I believe that there's so many church leaders online. There are so many leaders of tomorrow online. And there are people that have been in position of leadership. And I believe that this is a good time for us to understand where we are and where we are going in the foreseeable future. Um, I would like to diversify a little bit because they, our father is actually online at the moment. Um, our father, Papa Abidoye, his grace, Babaladra, prophet, Dr. Samuel Adefila Abidoye the spiritual father of the Cherubim and Seraphim Movement Church Worldwide, Ionio. We welcome our father as he joins us quickly because it, uh, we don't want to take his time and we don't want Baba to stay up for too long. And our father, his eminence, Baba Aladura, Prophet Dr. Samuel Adefila Abidoye, Ekabosa, Aki Ekabosorietoye, and we believe that your impact of knowledge in terms of leadership will be a goal for us to keep within this doctrine, within this sex for the rest of our lives. Please join me in welcoming our father, Ekabosa. Prophet Emmanuel, are you connecting, Baba? Yes, just a second. Trying to get home. Hold on, is here? Just hold on, please.
Um, um, Uncle Agbola, could you please un unmute yourself and turn on the camera, please? Is it logging on from Daddy Abuela's um, phone? Yeah, I'm I'm calling them directly again. Okay. Um, apologies, everybody. Um, uh, His Grace said that he will join us back later. It's just in the middle of something that's just happened urgently. So if we can just move over to the next speaker for now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I bring on to the camera our father, the pastor of the New Covenant Modern Church, Ikurudu, in person of Pastor Mike Ajayi. Good evening, sir. Good evening, everyone. I bring greetings to my fathers and my mothers online. May the grace of Almighty God continue to be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I would quickly like to continue from where uh, Prophet Odunaya paused. Uh, I appreciate the organizer of this program and I pray for more wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, my focus tonight, according to the uh, subtopic given to me, is delegation strategies for the church future leaders. Delegation strategies for the church future leadership. Um, if all of us can agree with me that we have experienced in the past where leaders believe that delegation is losing authority to the young one or to the vibrant one in the church. We have also experienced in the past where leaders believed that delegation is losing control over members to the young ones or to the vibrant one, ones in the church. We have also experienced in the past where leaders believed strongly that delegation is losing attention to the young ones, that members will no longer, will no longer give them attention, but giving the delegates more attention. So what am I going to bring out tonight on these delegation strategies for the church of the future? We need to understand the past. That is why I highlighted what we have believed in the past, what our leaders believed in the past, that when they delegate, they lose authority. They lose control over members and they lose attention. Then delegates gain more attention to themselves, more than the actual leaders. So we should be able to understand the past, then uh, examine the current situation. And we can see that currently we are facing the same thing that we are trying to move away from the past. And currently, we are still in the same scenario. We are leaders who occupy certain positions in our churches now. Are no, they are not ready there because of the fear of losing authority to the young ones. Fear of losing control to the young ones or vibrant uh, youths in the church and entirely losing attention to the young ones. Then what should we do now as leaders of tomorrow? And that is why this topic is very, very important to all of us, even those that are 
that are occupying leadership position in our different churches today. Remember this, God can do all things, but he delegated some to others. In the book of, part of the, uh, part of my scriptural focus today is in the book of Genesis chapter 2 verse 15. Genesis chapter 2 verse 15. Genesis 2 15 says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to walk it and take care of it. I think if we are to pattern our leadership lifestyle with God, this is a great example for every one of us. This is a great lesson for all the leaders that delegation of responsibilities and certain function does not start from us, actually started from God. God delegated his own responsibility to human. So that is the reason why I said God can do all things. Truly, he has the ability and strength to do all things. Nevertheless, he delegated some to others. And even not to others, to human being in the Garden of Eden, he delegated his own responsibility. What he has the capacity to do, he delegated it to human that take care of this land, take care of this portion for me. So our leaders and whoever that will lead our church tomorrow should understand that delegation of responsibilities and functions does not start from you. It actually started from God. God delegated and it is part of the quality that we should be looking into whoever that will be appointed as leader of our churches. Part of one of the foundational scripture, if you check the book of Exodus 18 from verse uh, 13 to 23, out of Apostles 6, 1 to 7, number 11, 10 to 16. We can just read that one uh, like that. So then the, the future, the church future leadership should understand this, that delegation is the process of getting things done through others. Sorry, getting things done through others. It does not matter who does the work. What matter is the result. And that is what we should put in our heart. Who does the work does not matter here. But how the work does, how the result gotten done, it should be our focus. So that is what delegation is all about. So delegation is all about the process of getting things done. It does not matter if you are the leader or you have been leading the church for so long, but what people want to see in your leadership is the results. It's not about your title as Prophet Yomi said the other time. It's not about your regalias. It's about results. And if you can see from the past, the major reason why our past leader failed is because they failed to delegate responsibilities. Even when they, they knew that they are weak, even when they knew that their capacity is not, is not they are not capable to perform the function again, you will still see them as if I, I just don't know what I can call it. So that is the major reason why many leaders have failed in the past. And if future leaders will do nothing but the best, we need to understand the conceptual uh, process and conceptual meaning of delegation of responsibility, even in the position of leadership. Because what people wanted to know is the result, 
not what, not what, or how you do it, or who does it. The results. We must be a leader of result oriented. Next slide, please. So uh, uh, you can see this uh, another quote here that it takes a man to have a vision, but it takes men. Please look at it critically. It takes a man to have a vision, but it takes men to achieve the vision. So let me take, for instance, Moses as a case study here. Moses was the one that actually called on Mount Oreb. But Moses cannot carry out all the responsibility, even though he was not previously learned about leadership. And he knew nothing about leadership, but he was taught by his father in law to share responsibility. You can be the visionary, you can be the vision, uh, vision carrier, but have it in mind. Any future leaders of our church should understand that you, it takes a man to have the vision, but it takes men collective responsibility to achieve the vision. And that is what delegation of responsibility, delegation of certain functions is all about. And it has affected our churches in so many ways. We have leaders only wanted to showcase that he is a leader and is not ready to share responsibility for others, even when the energy is normal there. Next slide says, it will rather I would rather it is a quote from Dr. D.L. Modi. Dr. D.L. Modi says, and I quote, I would rather set up 10 men to work than to do the work of 10 men. Let us examine this quote in our churches. We could see that all what we, we, we've centralized the activities, the functions of the whole church on our leader. Or let me put it that way that the leader assume the responsibility. They assume the responsibility. Why they're supposed to share responsibility. So that is the reason why Dr. T. E. L. Moody says, I would rather set up 10 men to work than to do the work of 10 men. And this has caused our past leader a lot of uh, a lot of mistakes and damages into the system, whereby they refuse to share responsibility and certain responsibilities are on ground, undone, untouched, and it's affecting the system. Now, let me quickly go to what makes delegation a necessity. What makes delegation a necessity? For the church, future leader, for the church, future leader, it is very necessary for us to understand this. Thank God for bringing me uh, up here in this matter as one of the coming generation leader of CNS. And I think my colleague in this, uh, in, in this generation should learn from this. What has led to the failure of our fathers should not make us fail in the position of leadership tomorrow. And this is one of the, this are uh, what makes delegation a necessity in every organization, not only in church setting. Number one, every leader is limited in time. Our leaders should understand this, that nobody have the, you, you don't have all the time. You don't have all the time. You can only live by the time apportioned to you by God. The Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes that there is time for everything. You, you can only reign during your own tenure, during your own time. You cannot use extra time. You cannot use another person's time with your own. So every leader should understand that they have limited time. 
to spare. Here or next, even when you are not changed in the position of the leadership, you have limited time on earth. And we should have it in our mind. And this made delegation necessity very, very necessary. Number two, because of our time, I, I will not talk much on those points. Every leader is limited in ability. What I can do now, when we'll be, we be saying another 20 years to this time, I will not be able to do it. I will be limited in strength. There will be limitation of what I can do. And our leaders refused, our past leaders, even the current leader, refused to understand this and yet not delegating responsibility to the upcoming one. Even when they have no ability to work, to even speak at time, they will still say, you are the leader, so you must do this. Being a leader does not mean you should do all things. Even if we can flash back to what happened in, uh, in Egypt, many of the miracles performed in Egypt were performed through the rod of Aaron, not the rod of Moses. Not the rod of Moses. Moses' rod only performed just two miracles in all the, in all the miracles. In all the miracles. So, delegation does not make you irrelevant. It does not shift your position of the leadership. It only gives you the ability to renew your strength and to save your energy, to save your ability. But our leaders fail to understand this. We should not forget, we should not forget that truly we need the, the youth need the experience of elders. And also, elders need the strength and ability of the youth to run the future. We need the past experience from the leaders. And leaders also need the strength and ability of the youth to run the future. And that is what our leaders should understand. That delegation of responsibility and authority never shifts you away from your position. It only gives you ability to do more and to save your strength and energy. Number three, strength. 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 We are limited in strength. What? Uh, sorry to mention this, what Baba Bidoye could do about 40 years ago, Baba cannot do it any longer. Why? Because the strength is not, it's not about yet. And what I can do as I'm speaking now, the next 20 years, the next 30 years, I will not be able to do it because the strength will begin to diminish. I will begin to diminish in strength. That is the way God has created human beings. And we should understand that. So if God himself, who created us in his image, can delegate responsibility to human, so why can't we emulate the same thing by delegating res certain responsibility to the coming one without removing or losing our authority, losing our control, or losing our attention? But it saves our strength in order to give them more long leave. But they wanted to do everything. Even when there is no strength again, they wanted to do everything. We should understand this, that it is very, very important and necessary to delegate responsibility. Next. You can do more through delegation. That means we can do more we can have more time when we delegate. But when we assume all work, functions, and responsibility, we cannot do more. We cannot achieve more. We can only achieve what we have ability and strength to cover. 
So I, I think by now our church should occupy a lot of countries, but because certain responsibility were not given to the youth who have the strength to run up and down. And that is the reason why we cannot do more than what has been done in the past. And I, I want, I, I believe you can also agree with me the majority of our current leaders started at very youthful age, very young age, but now they refuse to give responsibility to the young ones. When, 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 I, when I remember the year Baba Fakaya, the late uh, Baba, uh, Baba Fakaya started Surulere, Baba Fakaya was very, very young when he started Surulere. And he was given room to do all what he could be able to do. Currently, if we look at what Baba Adeboye of Redeem is doing, he cannot do what he has done in the past because he assumed the position of leadership at very tender age. He assumed the position at very young age. So he has run and achieved a lot. Now he was sitting to preach because he, the strength is no longer there. Yet he delegated responsibility. Our leaders should learn from this. They should learn from this. Let, let us look at the meditation. Meditation. I will give them some of your authority so they can share responsibility for my people. You will no longer have to care for them by yourself. That was the advice. Sharing our authority does not take the authority away from us. Sharing responsibility to others doesn't take our authority, the, the, the leadership authority, away from us. It's only giving us uh, it's, uh, it's only giving us uh, advantage of renewing our strength and taking care of ourselves so that people can take care of themselves. Next slide. So what delegation involves? What delegation involves? Delegation involves marrying authority from the higher level to the lower level. Yoruba people will say, sorry for those who cannot speak Yoruba, who doesn't understand Yoruba here. But what we are experiencing now from our leaders, they will give you a go and they will hold on the road. That is what we are experiencing now. Then when you, when you give people responsibility, you are not giving them authority to perform then people will not obey them. People will not respect them. So it is all about marrying authority from the, highest, from the higher level to the lower level. And we should understand that when we give people authority, when we give them responsibility, let us also accord responsibility with certain levels of authority in order for such to achieve its uh, uh, him an objective. Number two, delegation involves sharing responsibility. You are only sharing part of your function and responsibility to others in order to achieve the same goal. To achieve a particular goal. But without sharing it, what you can achieve will be very minimal. To what other can help you to achieve? Number three, shedding authority and ensuring accountability. Delegation involves shedding authority. It does not take responsibility, it does not take authority completely away from you. You only share. You only share part of your authority to the delegates and ensure accountability. I think that is what our leader should have been doing now and make the future of the church more better than the past. This. God can do all things as I've said, 
but he delegated some to others. To round it up, let us quickly check what are the reasons and benefits of delegation. Reasons and benefits of delegation. One, it is biblical. To delegate, it is biblical. It is not a method because what our elders assume is that it is a method of setting them away from the church, from the system. They will say, oh, I want my head to they want to fed by, not fed by Jomo Walo Wani. It's never. It is biblical. That is the mindset of our leaders. The, anytime we talk about delegation or uh, putting uh, strategic method in places, they will be thinking what it is. It's not like that. It is biblical. So that is one. Number two, enables leader concentrate on key areas of work. Delegation of responsibility and certain function enables leader to concentrate more on key areas of the church management rather than to put all the burden on them. And a lot will be on ground, on touch, and on done. But when those responsibilities are delegated, are shedding for others, the leaders will be able to focus on key area of church management and administration. And we can see that one in the book of Acts of Apostles, chapter 6, verse 2 to 4. Number three, not your design to do everything. Nobody is designed. I'm still repeating it because that is the mentality, that is our mindset. That because I'm a leader, I'm a district chairman, I'm a branch leader, that does not make you uh, give you ability to do all. Even God, who has all power, He said, Come, let us make man in our image. He called certain people to come together to make man in his image. So let alone human being, we were not designed. We are not created with the ability to do everything. We cannot do everything. That is number three. Number four, abilities of potential leaders release. When you delegate to delegates, the strength and ability of leaders. Okay, yes, I can see. The strength and abilities of potential leaders are released. You will be able to perform certain things, little that you have the ability and, and capability to do, rather than putting all load, all responsibility on yourself, and the whole system will collapse. And that is what we that is what we are experiencing in our churches today. The whole system is collapsing, yet the elders are not ready to release or to delegate responsibility because they don't have that ability again. And the little one they can do with the little strength, they will not focus it. They will want them to assume all functions. I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. Uh, let me just stop there for the last one. Benefits of delegation. Let me just make a reference to this. Last one. Delegates develop leadership mindset and better empathy. When we get them involved, they feel what the leaders are feeling. They will understand leadership better even before they assume the position. But here in our churches, because we have set the youth and the young one aside from understanding the conceptual meaning and practical functions of leadership, we do not give them the mindset. We don't develop their leadership mindset to become a better food, uh, leaders of tomorrow. In which we, if we don't, con we, we don't correct this, it will affect the future. So now we need to start delegate 
responsibility in order to develop their leadership mindset from now. I, I pray God will help our church to, to do the best for the future in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you and God bless you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Um, it's been, wow. It's been a very wonderful evening and we're still gaining at the faith of Christ. Um, it, I, I am so much empowered tonight that I am beginning to see the level of leadership within various ministries and we're, we're beginning to elevate into a new dimension under the auction of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that God will continue to make leaders out of us in Jesus' name. Um, sorry, I would have to bring in our Baba, Abid, uh, our father, his grace, Baba Ladra, Prophet Dr. Samuel Adefila Abidoye, the spiritual father of the Cherubin and Seraphim Church Worldwide, Ayonil. Please bring in our dad, our father, at this time. Well, good evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to speaking from here. When we are talking about leadership, only God appoints a leader. When human beings ask God or approach for a leadership, He always gives a directive. Sometimes when we make a lead, our leader, if he accept God in reality, God will be talking to him or her. God never leave his own people un unguided. Now, when we are speaking about leadership, leader must submit himself to the people he leads. Without understanding the people you are leading, you can't lead anybody. And you need God's help. It's God that can make a leader. Man may appoint a leader, but God make him. And if God doesn't want to make a leader, he cannot lead. And leading is not an easy job. It's interesting to see people directing the other. But you got to know what you are saying. You got to know where you are directing them to. You need God constantly by your side. A leader who has no guide of God is not a leader. Whatever we are, whatever we are doing, we must carry God along with us. That's all my family. I want to tell you that whatever you are, Wherever job you are asked to do, do it with happiness. Do it as if God is standing by your side and watching what you are doing. Because God never leaves his own people. He does not want a leader to lead his people wrongly. You cannot, you cannot submit them to yourself as if they are slaves. No, they are not slaves. The people you are leading, they are children of God. And God is watching every one of them. And therefore, a leader must always think and believe that he is always in the presence of Almighty God, watching him, whatever he is doing. Therefore, my family, whatever position you may be, leader or led, be peaceful, be, be quiet, and love God. No, no condition is permanent. Today you may be a leader, tomorrow you may, you may not be so. Today you may be led, tomorrow they may ask you to lead. The work of God does not stop any place. It continues to grow and grow and grow. And whatever position you find yourself as a leader, do your best to lead the people. Remembering that Jesus died because of the people you are leading. Remember that he shed his blood because of the people you are leading. And therefore, he will not want you to lead them badly or treat them badly or 
think about them as if they are slaves. No, they are all children of God. And none of them, God is not watching. He watch everybody. He is the maker of everything. Therefore, my family, and whatever we are, whatever is put before us to do, let us believe and remember that God is the, is the owner of everything. The position you are holding today, you may not be there tomorrow. Even if you are there tomorrow, you may have another higher. See the people you are, you are leading as a family, as friends, as children of God, then your leadership will be easy. Your leadership will be organized. Your leadership will be blessed. But a leader without the blessing of God is not a leader. Therefore, as you people go up, remember, and don't put it before your mind, that God is somewhere watching everything that's happening. How you lead, how you, how you, whatever you do, he is watching. And one day you will reap what you are doing. Therefore, my family, whatever people you are, whatever thing they ask you to come and do, and what position, whatever position you are, just think it as, as that is your lot, and do it with happiness and joy, and see how wonderful God is, how He changed from one person to another. Well, you know, the year now is going. We just start another new year. What are you going to do for the year? Are you ready to do everything in the presence of God? Carry God with you. By that, whatever you do will be prosper. Carry God with you. You will never make a mistake. Without God, nothing you can do safely. Without God, nothing you can do good. Therefore, my strong advice to you is we have a father who is asking us to call all upon him. We have a God, somebody who has shed his blood because of you and me and the other people you are leading. Therefore, my brother, leaders, male and female, lead people with carefulness. Lead people with fear of God. Let the people as if God is looking at you. And by that, you will enjoy your leadership. But if you fail to lead people according to God's place, God is watching you and he will repay you. Whatever you do, you don't do anything free. He knows and he pay you back in a way he thinks you can do it better. Therefore, my family, whatever position you are, as a leader, try to lead well, as led, try to behave nicely, because you are uh, led today, tomorrow you may be called to come and lead. So whatever person you are, always believe in God, always carry God with you. I say, we are just entering a year of 2022. God will take you through with the happiness of God. God will guide and guide you. God will protect you and your family. And God will bless every undertaking. Uh, let me tell you, by the grace of God, you will not die this year. Amen. Amen. So be prepared to enjoy your life. But whatever you are doing, always remember that God is there. And I pray that God will bless you. Let me make a short prayer for you. Father God, we are doing what we can do. You are God. We are human beings. We cannot know tomorrow. You know yesterday, tomorrow, and many, many years to come. Please guide us. Please show us the way. We do not want to make a mistake. But don't forget that man, the devil you drove away from heaven, is still in the world, roaming around, 
looking for whom to devour. And except we have you, Jesus, by our side, nobody is safe in the hand of the devil. But when you are with us, once we have you, we are sure and happy that we'll be going on happiness in the, in the year, in the month, and the, everything you do will be blessed. I say, God will bless you, keep you, abide with you, now and live forevermore. Amen. Good night. Amen. Bye. Amen. Thank you so much. The Bible says, great is the wisdom of the elderly. And we thank our father, our Babaladra, his grace, Babaladra, Prophet Dr. Samuel Adefila Abidoye. Baba, we say thank you so much for the impact of great wisdom. And we say that may God continue to strengthen you. Amen. Um, at this stage, um, if we have, if anybody has a question for Baba before he logs off. We're going to take just one question. If you want to ask any question from Baba in terms of the leadership future yes. of the cherubim and seraphim. I have a question. Yes, ma. Um, good evening, everybody. And good evening to Baba. And thank you for appearing. My question is, I'm just wondering, would CNS actually have like an age limit um, on the age that um, leaders can actually be? So that's my question. Thank you, Ma. Is that Prophet Shumoye speaking, yeah? Yeah. Um, Baba, um, Emmanuel, is Baba still online? Or yes, Baba is still there. Um, Uncle Dakwa, could you please unmute Baba? It's on, it's on. Okay, perfect. Okay, the question we have for Baba from Prophet Shumoye from the New Covenant Leadership Church. for leadership in Within the CNS. No, there's no determining date. You see, usually once you are met a head, usually this is a spiritual head meeting, you remain there until your death, mostly except for one reason or the other. If you are move away from where you are a leader to another area, you may not be leader there, you may become led. So uh, uh, there's no limit to everything, anything, wherever you are, and when the end comes, it's when the end comes. But every other thing, today you are here today, tomorrow you may be in London, next day you may be in America, Things are changing, and you got to change with the thing. But you need God to help you on the way. Wherever you go, whatever you want to do, always take God with you. Without God, you'll be sobering yourself. And being a leader of lead doesn't matter. Always remember that's God. Always read your Bible, and always. Remember that Christ is coming. And suddenly we come anytime. And if you die before his arrival, that's your, your, the coming of your of Jesus in your life. Therefore, my family, I want to say again to you, remember that love of God is the best thing of everything. And God is the best person who can direct you. It's he who can bless you. It's he who can confirm what you are doing. Therefore, remember your God. Pray always and read your Bible. Because in Bible is treasure which God has given to you for you and for me. Therefore, you can find anything in the Bible. Don't ignore your Bible. God bless you. Amen. Thank, you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, Baba, before you go, sir, um, I think one of our uh, one of our speakers earlier on said mm -hmm. or spoke about the succession at the level of leadership. 
is it practicable or is it doctrinal for us to have succession plans within our leadership, within the CNS movement? Prophet Emmanuel, has it left? Yeah. They have omitted. Yeah, so our succession is move, I move. And when you talk about move, I move, it is it makes the church easy. No struggle. Since you do not jump one or the other. You can't complain if it is move, I move. You wait until when you are your it's your time to move. Because there will be no front, nowhere to move to until your time comes where you will have to move. So therefore, that moving now and when I move, I think it makes peace in the church. It avoid argument, it avoid and um, quarreling, it avoid many problems and may bring peace and love. Then you wait until your time, nobody worry. You don't worry, they don't worry. And you believe that when it's your time, they will pick you. So move by move has been the best thing for the movement. And uh, we depend on it to do most of our things. But above all, God sometimes come in and choose another person. Suddenly, make you a wood or anything. Or oh, somebody may be, be promoted from one place to another. If you are a worker, even the Holy Spirit can send you some. So we depend on God. And we must always be ready to do what God wants you to do. By that, you have peace of mind. You have peace of happiness. And joy will be yours. Hold on to Christ. He's a father. He's a clearing father. And they will take care of you. Want to say good night again? Thank you, Daddy. God bless, God bless you. you, sir. Have, have long, 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 long joy in your life. Amen. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, sir. God Bye. bless you. Have a restful night. Wow. Um, we'll go on to the next speaker. In person of Pastor, Pastor Yomi Odukoya. Prophet Emmanuel, can you bring in Pastor? Yomi We're bringing him up now. Yes, please. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, and uh, God bless you. Good evening, sir. Thank you so much for inviting me and for allowing me to be a part of this. Uh, we've had you know, two, actually three actually, because our father just spoke to us, three great uh, speakers come uh, before me. And I pray that the little I will be able to give uh, over the next few minutes will be uh, in line with what we have been learning. So let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, because we know that you are good and your mercy endures forever. And we thank you as you lead us into this next session. Lord, go ahead of us, be with us, teach us, Lord Holy Spirit, that at the end of all of this and at the end of this whole program, we will have more and um, multiple reasons to glorify your name. We will get better and become better at being citizens of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Right, so uh, uh, Brother Emmanuel, thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you for the honor of inviting me. And I do not take it lightly at all. Uh, so my topic, uh, what I've been given to talk about is um, expectations of leadership. Now, you know that in all forms of leadership, there are expectations. It doesn't matter what leadership you claim to have of what. People expect things of you. There are expectations all around you. And within the church, whether it be the CNS church or other churches, um, people expect you to do certain things. And that's really important. But 
Over and above all of this whole expectation piece, there's one key word that I'd like to introduce first. And I think that key word will follow us all the way through. And it's something we'll take away from here. And that key word, and let me do this actually, that key word is character. That's the key word I'm looking for. So character is important to leadership. Indeed, character is what baselines leadership. And the first thing people tell us that you do with a building is set the foundation. And the first thing you do with the leader is ensure that the leader has a solid character. Absolutely important. A leader must have a solid character because that's how the leader is going to actually get to deal with the expectation levels that he or she will face. And the other thing, of course, is that we say the stability of a building is evidence of sound foundation. And by the same token, the stability of a church leader and hence of the church is evidence of the good character of the leader. When you have a leader with a bad character, that leader is unable to meet up with the expectations that the people, the church, everybody has of them, and therefore you have failing churches. And it's painful to note, but it's absolutely true that we do have failing churches all around us in every part, every sector of the church. And also it's important to note that it is not possible for any church leader, and by the same token, any church, to achieve beyond the boundaries of his or her own character. We are limited by how good we are in between here. And that is so important when we start to talk about expectations because expectations bring pressure. And when people get under pressure, it's their character that either bails them out or sees them fail. When you're pressurized by the things of life, when you're pressurized by the expectations of men and even of the spiritual nature of your job, if you're not careful, you might fall by your character. But if you're careful enough, you might even stand by the character that you have. So let's ask ourselves, what are leaders expected to do? What are the sort of things you see leaders do? And you'll understand why there's so much pressure. Well, a leader is expected to inspire people, right? Inspire people to do things. You're supposed to be the one who stands up and looks at a project, looks at the church service, looks at the at the uh, at Daniel band, looks at all of these things. The secretariat of the church looks at the choir. You're you're supposed to inspire them to attain great to greater heights. They listen to you. When you speak, your words sound like music in their ears. So there's something about you that inspires that that lifts people up to do more. Also, you're supposed to be an encourager. This is still you. You still you have to inspire people, and then you have to encourage them. Sometimes people might get a little bit low. You might see someone who is naturally a star, but you, they, they walk into church and you see there's something not quite there. Who's there? It's the leader who's there as well. Hello, how are you doing? I, I noticed that you were not your, your bubbly self today. What's gone wrong? That's the leader's job as well. Also, you're supposed to influence, not just by speaking, but by being. So you, you influence people by being who you are and also by speaking or teaching or preaching or every, either way you influence people. In other words, you cause them to do things that they might not have done without your influence. At the same point, at the same, by the same token, you're supposed to be a support structure. You're supposed to be the one who carries everything. You know how people draw um, uh, an, an organogram and the leaders at the top. You have managing director or CEO or Babala Drarat at the top. Well, the way to look at it is if you flip that organogram upside down that way, you will now find that the CEO or the Babala is at the bottom. That's the way it should be looked at. You're the one carrying the whole organization and you're supposed to support all of them. And you've got so many things you're catching and supporting, none is allowed to drop. At the same time, you're supposed to mobilize, get things going. All right, um, Joshua Band, you, it's, you're up. You're, you're the guys going to so and so. You're going to go to the model church next week. Um, oh, by the way, uh, da Daniel Band, you're, you're leading the prayer. Oh, prophets, you, you mobilize resources as required. So you see um, in, in the military, for example, you have these generals and the generals themselves don't actually go out and throw bombs at people or, or shoot anybody. They, they sit where they are, they strategize, they mobilize resources. They need to know what resources they have, how powerful those resources are. The leader is supposed to be so knowledgeable about every resource and is supposed to be able to mobilize those resources as the situation requires. 
also you're supposed to be able to direct things understand where things are where we're short where we have too much you know direct things make sure everything is working well invigorate that means when things are a little bit flat down you add a bit of pep into things look it doesn't matter how bad things are you find that the leader is not even allowed to show how bad things are you've got to be the one on top of your game you're the one telling everybody don't worry it is well and get some vigor into people, energize them as well to get through the work that they're supposed to do. There's a lot more. I could put this and have another seven or eight and there'll be different things. Leaders are responsible for so many things and that is why they come under a lot of pressure. So what are the expectations then? I've broken down these expectations based on what we know a leader should do. I've broken down these expectations into five things. Number one, is to be an example. And the expectation that we have of our church leaders is that they must exemplify through their words, their actions, and their lifestyle, the qualities and values that will encourage the members' voluntary followership of the vision. Note I said followership of the vision that was set by God. They're not supposed to follow you. They're supposed to follow the vision that you cast the vision that God laid on your heart that you have communicated to the people. I heard the, the prophet say at the beginning, they need to be good communicators. So you need to communicate the vision that God has set in your heart to people. But people will only follow that vision if you are an example through your words, through your action, and through your lifestyle. Remember what Paul said to Timothy, that he should be an example in all ways, in conduct, in the way he presents himself. He had to be an example to the people he was going to teach. As a leader, you must exemplify, not just through words, but you must act on the words that you do. And your lifestyle must showcase what you teach. There is no point whatsoever teaching something uh, teaching everybody, let's go on to the right-hand side. And then when they look for the pastor, pastor has gone left, even though he's told everybody, let's go to the right. Now, that is a, a serious lack of integrity. And unfortunately, we find a lot of that in past, present, and so-called future leaders. I have seen older leaders who should know better fail on this point. I have seen current leadership fail on this point. I have seen young people fail on this point. So it's something that all of the leaders of whatever age, whatever generation, we need to make sure that we live exemplary lives. See, we all talk about the God of Abraham, the God of so-and-so. If these people did not live exemplary lives, if they did not follow the law of God, we would not be calling the God of anybody. But we say God of this person because we saw the example of God in them. And so the first thing that is a major expectation of all leaders is that they must be exemplary in word, in action, in thought, in lifestyle. Indeed, everything they do must be exemplary. The qualities and values that they espouse must encourage the members to voluntarily follow. Pastor Mark was saying that, you know, you, 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 can't, you can't just try do everything yourself but people need to be encouraged by who you are that they voluntarily follow the vision that you cast you don't have to beg anybody to do things and you delegate because you know there, there's something about you that actually brings people to you say uh daddy father what do you want us to do for you they they actually come they seek to draw from you because of who you are. You don't have to call, hey, somebody, Jima, come here. No, 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 no. Jima will come in the morning and ask you, Daddy, what can I do? Because of your example. So that's one of the biggest expectations that leaders struggle under, but which we must master if we are to move anywhere with the church of God. The second thing is, they must continuously and consistently serve with the express aim of providing benefits or adding value to those that they're given the privilege of leading. The reason for your uh, being a leader is to serve others, to provide benefits for other people other than yourself, or to add value to other people, not to add value to yourself, 
not to add money to yourself, not to get yourself in such a grand situation. You know, sometimes you, you see when, when a leader sits on what looks like a throne, some kings, you know, you, you, you've seen, some kings don't have thrones that our leaders have got. We, we look like royalty. We, we sit on these big chairs. We look, we walk like peacocks. You know, when, when we put that our cap on and we start to strut, you know, I, I, I remember the good old days when, when we'd be doing a sermon. Thank, we thank God for, for a change. We'd be, do, you'd be doing a sermon or we're worshiping God or praying to God. And then a father will come and they will stop the service and start, uh, and start singing a song. Um, so that the man can come in. So we, we, we give thank God, wait for us. We want to honor this man. So you, God, you can pack yourself. We're not, we're not going to pray to you for the next five minutes. And then we start to sing Kerubweyo to a, a human being who ha has actually arrived late for church. He came late. And we stopped our service to God to honor him. That's not where we're supposed to be. We're supposed to serve because God has given us a privilege to bless other people. But not just that, we need to do it continuously and consistently because a 95% service plan is still not good enough. There is something that God has given to the leadership to provide to the people. And until that is provided, it's not done. The work is not done until it is done. In other words, until everything in you is emptied out. So it's not a case of I serve today and then you start to you know, you wipe your brow. Ah! Man, ah, we did well today, and, and so on and so forth. You have to be at it all the time. You might think, oh, I'm, I will break down, my body will break down. No, it won't, because the God who gave you the responsibility will also give you what it takes to do the job. If God thinks that something is too big or too much for you, he won't give it to you. If it gets too much for you, think, think about it yourself. Maybe you grab somebody else's job and add it into yours. Uh, you just do your own path. You find out you've got all the equipment you need, all the strength you need, all the ability you need for your own path within God's master plan. So we must be continuous and consistent in our service. And the main aim must be to provide benefit for others or to add value to other people. Number three, we need to inspire others by deploying sound principles and living by exemplary values. And the reason we want to do this is to maximize the potential of members and mobilize the resources that they have. Again, you see how the spirit works. The right bang on track with what Pastor Mark was telling us, that you need to maximize the potential of those people who God has given you to lead, empower them, fire them off, mobilize what they command. You see, the people that God has given to you command resources. They've got their own abilities that God has given to them. We need to know that we're not the only ones with abilities. The biggest part of a leader's role is to create other leaders. You were created by a leader. Somebody made you, somebody taught you, somebody brought you to where you are. You can't then cut off the tap and say, well, I'm not going to let the tap flow downwards anymore. I just want all our fathers to continue blessing me with knowledge and with elevation, and I'm going to cut off the tap. I don't want it to flow down. The tap must flow down. And so it's our job as leaders to inspire those who are coming up, maximize their potential, even never get, never be, uh, what's the word? Never be uh, challenged or, or afraid of someone else's ability. Listen to me, you might be the greatest choir master of all, but I guarantee you there's a 14 year old in your choir who will out sing you, out dance you, out drum you, out play you on any instrument. That's who God designed for you to inspire. They're not supposed to be your enemy. They're not supposed to be the one you hate to talk to. They're the ones you're supposed to say, look, listen, I give you all that I have. I know you're even more talented than I am, but I'm going to give you all that I have. And that will be grow the church. We grow the next level of leadership. The fourth thing is to have a deep sense of purpose. Understand why you are where you are. You see, when you understand why, you get things right. When you don't understand why things are happening or why things are in place, you misuse opportunities. You misuse your office. You abuse your office, actually. But when you have that intense passion for people and a commitment to excellent moral principles, you will serve well. That is what we're looking for in the current leadership and also in those who will be appointed to become leaders in the future. They must have a sense of purpose. I am here because God has provided me to the people. 
Behold, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me. That has got to be right there. You need to know why you're a prophet, why you are the leader, why are you the senior apostle? Why are you the head of the prophets? Why are you the choir master? Why are you the head of the instrumentalists? You need to know why. And then you need to have a, a great passion for developing people and a commitment to your, to sound moral principles. This whole nonsense we hear in the choir, that's when the choir master is sleeping with somebody else and all sorts of nonsense going on in the church. Leadership is, is on its knees because those who have been appointed to lead lack the moral principles to, to sustain those positions. And then people look at them and go, well, if that's what leadership is like, I want none of this. And you're asking, we keep asking, why are people leaving the church? Well, people are leaving because they want none of what they're seeing. So we need to fix our leadership such that we get to a place where leaders are showing the right kind of example to people. And the last one here is to consistently exhibit a standard of integrity and conduct that reflects the trust and responsibility that is placed on our shoulders. This is a non-negotiable thing. There's, see, when you say, I will be here at 9.30 in the morning, please be there at 9.30 in the morning. If you say, oh, uh, we need so-and-so for the church, let it be that whatever you say is exactly what, what happens. Let it be that you are true to your word and that, Every, everyone who looks at you can actually believe what you say. Because a great trust has been placed upon your shoulders. As a leader, you are responsible for lives, for careers, for ministries, for different things in people. There are so many people who will come into prominence just by your teaching or by the laying of, hands, of your hands on them. The Bible says the Spirit of God was upon Joshua because Moses laid hands upon him. So there, there is so much in us. But if the person who is going to lay hands is a liar, what kind of spirit will you impart into the one that kneels in front of you? If you take a vial of oil and you anoint somebody, but you carry the spirit that lacks integrity, you carry a spirit that, that, that steals, or, or, then what are you doing? You're creating a whole generation of, oh, I don't want to know what, I don't want, I don't know what to call it. So we need to ex ex exhibit that standard of integrity and conduct in all that we do. So that even the God who appointed and anointed us will be pleased to call us his servants. And that's so, so important. So these are five expectations of church leadership. Some of these things we struggle with. We may not sometimes agree and say, oh, well, I don't struggle with these things. But these are the things that are causing our churches to fail because leaders are not able to meet up with these expectations. Now, I'm going to look, the next part here for the next few minutes, we're going to look at who are the people who, are, who have these expectations. And you can see there from this diagram, I've got six different groups who have expectations of us. I've got God, I've got other churches, the government, the young Christians, the church members, and the world around, around us in general. All of these groups are six of amongst many groups that have expectations of leaders. And we need to recognize this. If you don't know what's expected of you, how do you get to fulfill that expectation? If you don't know the requirements of your role, if you don't know what's right from wrong, if you don't know what will constitute success or failure, how do you then track your own progress? How do you grow as a leader? It's important we understand what the expectations are. So let's go through these expectations. The church members expect guidance. They come to you, mom, dad, father, pastor, priest, help me to understand this situation. We need to know that this is part of our role. A leader must guide. A church leader must be ready to guide. They also expect support. How many times have you heard, I'm struggling here. I need help. I need some support in different areas. Some people need support in their marriages, in their businesses, in their finances, you might think, well, I'm not a finance guru. I'm not a marriage counselor. People of God, if you are a leader, you need to support. You might support by linking them to someone who is an expert, but they still need your support. That's so important. Church members also expect a roadmap. They come, they come to you and say, well, uh, our Father and the Lord, good afternoon, sir. Well, I have got these four or five things to do. I've got that one, that one, that one, that one. Where should I go? And you're looking, uh, I don't know where to go. 
Well, you're expected to provide a roadmap, which is why your connection to the Spirit of God can never be broken. Because the roadmap for life is within the purview of God. And as a leader, you need to be so connected to God that when people bring a roadmap question to you, you're able to provide them with a roadmap. They also expect knowledge. They come to you. Sir, I was reading something in Romans chapter 5. And you, start to, you start to worry. Is it true what the Bible says? Or a friend of mine said that in Thessalonians, so you need to know. A leader needs to know because your members and those who depend on you for leadership expect that you know. If you don't know, then they think, well, he can't lead me. He doesn't know more than I do. So he cannot possibly be my leader. And so there's a responsibility on us to continue to learn. Someone said, I think it was the first speaker said, if you don't learn, you die. And that's true. The day you stop learning, you die. We, we've all heard that before. But it's so true and so apt with church leadership. And churches are dying today because leaders are not learning. We're doing all the things we used to do before in the same ways we used to do them. And even though they failed the last time, we just repeat them again, definition of madness. So we need to learn so we know. That's for the church members. The world around you expects an example. Even though they don't come to your church, they tell you that your faith should be an example to us. You cannot claim to be a Christian. You, you go out there and fight. They say, ah. But they call himself a Christian. Look at him fighting. Now, they don't believe in your God. But they know all the moral standards that you should have. So you go out there and misbehave. They go, uh, this is why we don't go to church. So the world around you, even the unchurched, even those who do not believe in anything, they expect an example from us. They also expect contribution from you as leaders. You can't be a leader and not help in the community. It's not enough anymore to just go into church, clap your hands, jump a little bit, um, sing a few songs, pray a little bit, and then go home. Right now, the community around, the Bible says the world, everyone, the world is awaiting the manifestation. They are awaiting the manifestation of the leaders of the house of God, but we're not manifesting outside. Instead, we're just going into the church, clapping a few hands, and then starting to fight each other about who gets promoted to what, to what title. But that's not where we need to be. The world out there, even those who don't believe in your God, are waiting for you to provide some contribution to society. Also, they need a safe haven. You know how people run into a church and expect to be saved, even though they don't believe? They come on the day when you're doing your prayer, and they know that somewhere in this house, there is a man of God, a woman of God, they're expecting you to save them from the world that they have created, even though they have nothing to do with your God. But this is a valid expectation. Also, I talked about integrity before. They expect you to do exactly what you preach. This is true of the world around us. What does the government expect? We live in a world, after all, governed by people. We say, yes, we are part of God's kingdom government. But what does the government actually expect? Lawfulness. If you are a leader in your church, pay your tax, pay every lawful remittance to the state. It's, it's unbecoming if, if we go into, uh, into onto the website of the Charities Commission and we are seeing that your church is 700 days late to submit your, 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 you know, your, 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 your statement and all things like that. It does not look good. There's an expectation from the government of the day that you also have processes that stand up to regulatory scrutiny. It's not a case of where, you know, the, the pastor's got money, the pastor's money, the church's money. No one knows the difference. Pastor is spending all the money or just doing what he likes or whenever he likes. No accountability, nothing. No integrity with, with, with processes. We cannot live like that. We, can, we certainly cannot leave a church that has zero processes to the young ones who are coming. That would be a travesty. Imagine handing over, imagine if the people handed over to us a broken institution, an institution with no, with, with no values. That would be a shame, wouldn't it? So there's an expectation on us to give to our children and to the ones who are coming a, a, an institution, a church of God, a kingdom environment that stands up to every scrutiny. Indeed, because the scrutiny of heaven is much tougher than the scrutiny of the earth, we should be able to pass with flying colors any scrutiny that any government places upon us on the face of the earth, if we are truthful, if we know what we are doing. Also, the government ex ex expects support from us. Local and national programs, what is the church doing? What are the leaders in the church doing? I keep saying to my church, government was asking everybody, 
we have got something called COVID-19. They asked the people in the labs. They asked the people in administration. There were some guys who were, they asked the police. They asked the NHS. Nobody asked the church what to do. Because we were not relevant. Has anybody come to your church to ask you what the answer to COVID-19 is? But we believe we have a God that when we pray, it does not matter what it is, it can be solved. But nobody asked us because they don't see us as relevant. We need, the government needs us to support. But because we were not providing that support, they didn't bother coming to us. And so all they did to us was tell us to close our churches. Also, they want us to maintain peace with other religions and faith. It's good we hear, we, when you speak to guys of the Islamic faith, they tell you, oh, we're the faith of, uh, the, the, the faith of peace. Now, some people don't believe that, some people do believe that. But we, as children of God, need to maintain peace. Expectations of the leaders of the church. We cannot be seen to be fighting each other. Even we have fights within, within churches, within the CNS church, X church is not talking to Y church. Um, RCG, one branch of RCCG is not even inviting the pastor of the one that's next door to, to the convention. They go and invite somebody from seven streets away. When there's a pastor next door who never comes to their church. We have all kinds of infighting. The choir is fighting with the instrumentalist who is fighting with the prophet and the prophet is fighting with the, with the wardens. And we're all going to church. We need to maintain peace within our religion, within our churches and within between other faiths as well expectations of leadership. What do the young Christians expect of us as well? Well, they expect us to listen. They just want somebody to listen to what they're saying. They've got ideas. They've got thoughts. They have something to say, and they know it's relevant. They've read the Bible. What are the days when you say to a child, ah, don't worry, uh, sorry, where are you, Genesis chapter 5? No, that's too advanced for you. Who told you that? When they explain the Genesis chapter 5 to you, you will sit down and learn. These young ones have got ideas. I know. See, I spent so much of my life working with youth. And people used to say to me, um, ah, ah, yeah, I like my young people. We didn't see you in church today. I said I came to church. We didn't see you. We haven't seen you for the past four weeks. I had no reason to come to church because the youth was at the back. I used to go by the side and go to the back and go to the youth. I had no reason to come to the main church. I was being energized by these young people. The young generation, the, the upcoming generation of leaders, they have got something to say, and what they have to say is relevant and will be the basis of the church going forward. If we don't realize that we're struggling badly already. Change. Young ones want to change some of the old ways of doing things. Listen, they, they don't want to turn everything on its head, but they can see that certain things need to be modernized within the same structures, within the same basis of the Bible, they just want these things done in a modern way, but based on the same biblical principles of the kingdom of heaven. But we tend to push them away because it sounds as if it sounds threatening. They want to move everything online, and then suddenly we're all shaking because <laughs> Pastor cannot, doesn't know where the keyboard is and so on. Let's not be like that. Let's listen to these young ones. They need change. They also need guidance. How many times have you heard a young person ask, show us, sir, what you did. Tell us what you know. We will take what you did and what you know, and we will apply it in our own way and bring out the beauty of your experience, mix that with our enthusiasm, and bang, the church is going. But if we don't listen to them and change, then the, you know, we, we, we find ourselves struggling. So the expectations that the younger ones have of us is to listen to them, to change when required, to guide them, and also to be of exemplary conduct. It is shameful when leaders are found doing the things that they should not be dabbling in. And we still see it day after day. How can we encourage good leadership? How can we stabilize a church when the people in front are not in keeping with the will of God. Clearly not in keeping with the will of God. It's only in our church. We, 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 we're so loose sometimes morally. I, I, I've got to say, let, let's be honest, morally, sexually, in so many ways we're loose. And because our leaders are not doing the right things, our young people are saying, huh, we can't have this. I know that that's wrong. And if this man or this woman can do this and still come and ask me to kneel down and say, I want to anoint you, I'm thinking, no, sir, you can't anoint me. There's an evil spirit in you that allowing you to do these things. I'm not having that anointing. I'm going to go somewhere else. Expectations of the younger Christians. What do other churches expect of us? They expect cooperation. Let's work together as the body of Christ. 
let's pray together on various topics. You know, that's what they want. We may not do things the same way. You might be celestial. I might be redeemed. Uh, the other person might be CNS or the other person might be mountain of fire. We may do things in slightly different ways, but we serve the same God. Think about it. It's, about, it's like having embassies of one kingdom, one government. There's only one government, the government of God. And all of these can be like embassies. So think about the embassy of the United Kingdom in Australia looks different from the embassy of the United Kingdom in Nigeria. It's not manned by the same people. They do things slightly differently because they're speaking to Australians and these guys are speaking to Nigerians, but they are embassies of the same kingdom. Likewise, RCCG, uh, winners, whatever it is, embassies of the same government. We may not do things the same way. We may not look alike, but we need to understand each other. Create a strong body of Christ. Right now, it's not as strong as it should be. There's too much weakness because we allowed us, we've allowed ourselves to be separate. And they also expect camaraderie. Let there be an atmosphere of friendliness and not angst in the church of God. That's what other churches expect. I'm going to close on a few things. How many minutes have I got left? I've got about five minutes left, right? Uh, two minutes, yeah. But... Two minutes, yes. Two minutes. I'm going to close on this one here. Um, credibility and expectation. And it's important. Your credibility as a leader is rooted in your character and your integrity. That's where we started from, character your behavior and the results that spring from your behavior is what will be your story and the story of the church. Your credibility is more important than the figures or how much touch and offering or whatever you're collecting. You need to be seen as an incredible leader. Therefore, you must understand that if you are not credible and you get it wrong, the whole church is seen as getting it wrong because you lack credibility. Also, you must be trustworthy. At some point, you've got to stop talking and start doing. Talking big and walking small will dampen any trust in your ability to meet expectations. The last one I'm going to say here, if you break promises as a leader, then the trust that people have in you will be eroded. And I tell you, the downward road is quicker than the upward road. What took you so many years to build can be destroyed in one moment of a broken promise. So there's a lot more about expectation of leaders, but I thought this, this should be enough for us to think about. Basically, let's remember this, your character is important. You will never do anything beyond the confines of your character. You also need to understand what the various expectations are of you as a leader and how you deal with them. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you so much, Pastor um, Odukoya, for a great word on the expectation of the church leader. Um, before, I think we're going to get, we're going to uh, bring in the fourth speaker before I do a summation, a brief summation, then we'll have a question time. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I bring onto the platform Pastor Adekunle Fakile. Pastor Emmanuel, uh, Prophet Emmanuel, please bring him on. Yes, just a second. Here it is. <clears throat> Over to you, Uncle. Hello, everyone. Can you please uh, allow me to share my screen, please? Um, thank you. Uh, share screen. Okay, thank you, everyone. First and first, I want to... Uh, say uh, this, uh, it, it's, um, I want to thank uh, the organizers of this program for granting me this opportunity and I stand on the existing uh, protocol. Uh, but most importantly, I want to appreciate every one of us that are still online. Uh, I can see the number of people that are still uh, online presently, despite the fact that uh, we have uh, spent quite a lot of time um, today on this uh, issue of uh, leadership. It's my prayer that your time will not go to waste in the mighty name of Jesus, and the Lord Almighty will bless every one of us. Uh, it's interesting that um, uh, two of our speakers um, are called Yomi Odukoya, Pastor Yomi Odukoya. Uh, 
and the prophet Yomi Udunaya is Yomi and Udu. So again, I just want to sort of uh, permit me to just make certain changes that uh, I will change uh, pastors, uh, Pastor Mike Ajayi's name to your Mike and Udu Ajayi, and uh, I will suddenly become Yokule and Udukile, if that is uh, allowed, so that I mean things can just rhyme like that. <laughs> Praise God. I... Uh, <laughs> Uh, what I'm going to be talking about is going to be uh, a church, a church future leadership in contest, uh, church leadership in contest. And um, it is my prayer that the Lord Almighty will uh, speak uh, to us today. And I believe that the spirit of, of the Lord Almighty is still very much a present on this uh, platform. Uh, I'm going to share this uh, very uh, uh, sm- uh, short story. Uh, there was a young, uh, enthusiastic uh, pastor uh, that was sent to India on a missionary journey. Uh, he was called to minister that day when he got there to, to unbelievers. So incidentally, it was the day that the son was out that day after a long winter. So he started by saying, here is the son. Jesus is the son bringing light to our darkness and warmth to our cold, godless world. He was so passionate. He was enthusiastic about it and uh, about what he said. And he felt good that he had done a good job of interpreting a Christian symbol in a very contemporary sort of a uh, time or way that day. So after the session, I mean, during the session, he noticed that uh, there was a bit of a uh, coldness <laughs> after saying all that. So uh, an Indian went to him and the an Indian was not really impressed by what he said. And he said to the pastor, uh, sir, the sun is not something that brings refreshment here. It is something that brings unbearable heat that is to be avoided by staying in the shade. It makes men and women in our community thirsty. The sun causes sunstroke. So he could not relate to a savior that comes like a sun. So despite the fact that the sun is a very biblical symbol of God, this is a problem that contest can bring because sometimes your truth is not your truth especially when you're not speaking it in the context of where you are. The session that the forum that we are having today, I think applies mostly to people that I call the diaspora. And we suffer so much from these contextualization problems where we import something, a meaning from a culture into another culture, and we believe that the problem is with the people that we're serving, not with us. So where is meaning located? Is the meaning for that particular word, son, was the meaning in the speaker or in the hearer of the word or in the word itself? So this is an example of conservation in the diaspora community. So too much damage has been done and we are too arrogant to see the damage. It is my prayer that the Lord Almighty will open our eyes today in the name of Jesus. So, yeah. you know, I, I, I want to say this. There was a, this uh, conference, it's a uh, design committee uh, for world uh, evangelization. Uh, in one of its uh, occasional paper, I think it's uh, paper number 41, uh, that was written around, uh, I think it was uh, early 20, uh, 2004, 2006, or thereabouts. And uh, it was a forum. Uh, at that forum, they shared a vision. And the vision that they shared was a global movement for developing Christ-like leaders. So they wanted us to imagine a world where, they wanted us to imagine a world where every leader is mentoring younger leaders. Where leaders is both Christ-like and contextual. Where leaders partners together across boundaries so that you know okay though i may not be able to understand the culture over there but we are able to partner in 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 a way whereby okay we can still sort of do some kind of uh, skill transfer across the border where millions of future leaders are imagining bringing the world the whole gospel of uh, of the lord uh, jesus christ to the whole world and as they did that 
They asked at the end of that session, they said, they asked, where would it lead and what would happen? That imagination led to something. They said, the vision would be a galactic explosion rather than our simple fireworks. Simple fireworks that is being a, a small firework in, uh, uh, in um, what do I call it? Maybe in Manchester, small firework in uh, Lagos, small firework in uh, uh, US or New York, small firework in Italy. They're saying, by the time we have skillful leaders coming together, working together for the gospel, that vision will be a galactic explosion rather than our simple fireworks. There's no doubt that the church is uh, experiencing some phenomenal growth. Yes, we can see it in some uh, uh, pockets of uh, churches and all that. But there is growth that is experienced in the body of Christ and ministry due to the current exploit in ministry and the increased level of despair, especially now, and unrest in many places. And these situations have presented the church with growth opportunities so much. As new churches are emerging, new leaders are also emerging. Unfortunately, many of the leaders do not have the necessary training for such an office. They are, they are not also, they are not prepared for the position where we have exist and where we have existing programs. Uh, it, it cannot keep up with the base of the need that we need in the church. So, another problem is that they are, they, they, in many cases, they, are, are they able to really equip leaders for the changing realities of the 21st century as experienced in many areas, such as in our culture, uh, in our the availability of knowledge? And I, and, I mean, I, and I mean vast knowledge today, the new technology, postmodern influences on, on, of the West that we live in, and the, even for us that are now in Africa, the influences, the daily influences that we experience from the West. The globalization um, uh, that, that we have happening every day, uh, terrorism, increased speed of life and urbanization, uh, youth propagation. And uh, uh, if you look at it, the weakening of our community ties and traditions that we have amongst ourselves. So if you look very well, the current pandemic as well has exposed the weakness in church leadership. So where are we going with all this? And what I'm, we're trying to say here is that uh, leadership in African context. How do we define uh, leadership in the African context? In, in Africa, the way we see leadership is that leadership in, in Africa, a leader is an individual who exercises much influence and command the respect of others because of the power and authority associated with his position in the community for society. We have imported this idea from Africa because it works in Africa and we expect that it's going to work in Europe. That's a major problem. That's a major problem. So what is leadership? I think my fathers have spoken variously about leadership and I'm not going to spend so much time on this one. We know that uh, uh, leadership is all about authority, about uh, influencing people and uh, about the power. But how do we define the differences in this? And I, I, I put it this way, that authority is the power that is formally given to an individual or group because of the position that they occupy. The moment you become a leader, that's it. You have that authority. And power is the ability of a person or a group to influence other people or groups. Unfortunately, this is where the problem lies. And I'm going to be talking about that later. And then influence is the ability of a person or a group to affect what another person or group does or think. That is where their power is. When you are able to influence them, people that do not want to even take their Bible and read this for the whole year, and you are able to influence them, and they are able to do it and come out with a testimony. People that are unable to take a walk to say, yes, I am ready to go on that missionary journey. I am ready to abandon that thing only because you have influenced them, whether by what you do, Pastor uh, Yomir Dukoya says, so they look at your example and they are motivated and they say to and said, why, why am I like this? I must take a step today. That is where the power is. Not when we shout at them. Not when we threaten them. It is when we are able to influence them. We influence them so much that they think that they, they took that decision themselves. So, leadership is a position of authority, power, and influence 
Leadership is responsibility. Leadership can also be seen as a vehicle through which plans and actions are conceived, acted, and implemented. So I'm not going to dwell too much on that because of time. Um, so call to leadership. This is where our this is where our biggest problem lies. I raised up my hand earlier when our Baba was speaking, but I believe that the Holy Spirit said to me, Fakile, shut up. Um, so I'm not going to go there that much, but I will speak. Um, so young, so again, let me let, let me try as much as possible and articulate this in the, the best way I can articulate it. So uh, call to leadership. Uh, if you look at Acts 6, 3, it says, Wherefore, brethren, look among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom you may appoint over this business. There are things to look for before you put people in leadership, not by saying sukin su. It was never like that. Andrew was the first disciple of Jesus. The gospel makes it clear. But Peter, was the one upon which, upon whose shoulder the church was left on the day. Not because he was the first. No, Peter was not the first. Andrew was the first. So again, I am, I am, I'm still a young person, but I interpret the Bible the way the Holy Spirit interprets it. And this is the core of the problem that we have when we put people that have not been called for a particular role, we put them in position. But I'm going to be talking about that later. So leadership is not about the title, it's not about the honor it's and glory, but it's about the work that is involved. Jesus said, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Mark 9, 35. So they are not selected because you are, you are not selected because you are available. If people are selecting you to become a leader because you are available, wow, that's a problem. Not because you are volunteering for it or because you aspire to the position, but should be chosen by the church if they possess the required qualifications. And let me say this, and I want to say this very global boldly, in that. You know, uh, in fact, let, 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 me, let me go back. Let me go back so I don't overrun myself. Um, now, if we look at uh, the call to leadership, I'm quickly going to go over this. How there are four paths that you can take to be, called, to be called into leadership. These are the four paths. Number one, by calling. This is when God sent an individual, set an individual apart for a divine as assignment. So you will look at the example of Abraham, the example of Moses, the example of David and Jeremiah, and many other people like that. God sets them apart. The calling of the Lord Almighty is upon them. We see that they have the call of God upon them. The second way is by recognition of the gift of God upon that person. And please remember, uh, uh, the gift of leadership is also one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. People don't have the gift of leadership. And I don't know what consultation that we have made and come back to the church and say, this is going to be our leader. When they clearly don't have that gifting. So identify, identify appreciate, appreciable uh, deposit of gifts, talents, and potentials to make one great and respectable leader in his or our church community. And we have the example in Timothy. And we have uh, the Proverbs 18, 16, say a man's gift makes room for him. The third path is by apprenticeship, training. Now, potential leaders can and should undergo apprenticeship. Whether you have been called, whether you have the gift, you must also undergo some level of training so that you can be contextual, so that you can be relevant. But unfortunately, we, don't. we become a leader and that's the end of it. We have an example of a, 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 um, a, a prophet uh, Elisha mentor a uh, prophet elijah being mentored by elijah we have the example of samuel samuel was a great leader and prophet in israel he was not just great he had his own share of service under another man of god named eli and by service we have the example of jephthah uh, in that in, in that situation, and it's a good example of service. Jephthah worked so much and delivered so much for the community, and they said, "Wow, who else can become the leader here?" Jephthah, come. But but can you just imagine with me when you have a leader that has the four? 
he was called, he has the gifting, he had the training, and then he has the exemplary exa- exa- exemplary character. Would I say no? But by what he has done in terms of service for that community, Do, can you see how explosive? Can you see how effective such a person can be? So we look at this problem, we notice we don't address it, and then we still say we have to leave that few problems. Let us go back and do the right thing. These are the issues that we need to be bold to face as we are addressing this issue uh, today. Now, the next thing I want to say is that now, and I'm saying this without apology, a leader or church that has money to build a church building and are not building the people is a casket in waiting. It's a casket in waiting because you're just... Look, you have people that are going to be in a building and they're not being led anywhere. They are not being encouraged to do anything, to do something great in ministry. It is a casket in waiting. The only problem is that you're not going to see it for when you are still alive. And I hope that this is addressing people that are currently in leadership and people that are aspiring to be leaders and people that don't even know or even they are not aware of the fact that they have been called into leadership tomorrow. So, moving on. What effective leaders do? I am not going to touch this because, wow, Pastor Yobi Odukoya, uh, you, 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 you dealt with it. So I, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to talk about this anymore. I'm just going to move on from here. So please, if you have not listened to me at all, please, this is very important. And this is what, this is my observation about uh, the leadership in some churches. And I'm not talking about CNS churches alone. Let's look at this uh, slide. The issue is, Let's start from position one. Five level of effective leaders. Leadership ability determines a person's level of effectiveness. So some people have become leaders because it is their right. Their father died. All of a sudden, you have now become the head of the family. No skill, no gift, no service. You have become the leader. Oh, the leader of the church died. And then because it is so so, you have become the leader all of a sudden. So by your right, because you were in the church before, even though it was by accident, even though you have been in the church 20, 20 something years ago, but you only received Christ about five years ago, and other people that have received Christ about 20 years ago or whatever, and we can see the quality in them. They cannot become the leader only because it is so so. So it happens in the family. So it happens by right because it is your right to become the leader. Yes, that's fair enough. And that is not a problem, really. It is not a problem. So you have become a leader. People follow you because they have to, because you have become the leader. Don't forget, when I was uh, uh, defining uh, leadership, and I said it is a position that comes with authority. So the moment you become a leader, by right, people have to follow you. Rehoboam, First King 11 is an example. But do you know something? There are many leaders that die they operate and die at this level. They never move to the second position. You will do well if you move to the next position. And that next position is a position that we call permission. And let me just say this. This, this uh, model is a model, by the grace of God, I'm a John Maxwell uh, uh, leadership trainer. And this is a model. It's one of the models that, that we use in teaching. And obviously, we, we, we are allowed to adapt this for the Christian forum. So let, let so I, need, I need to make that iteration. So permission is the level whereby you move from position to permission. People follow you because they want to. Can you imagine when you become a leader somewhere and people don't want you to become leader? Ah, it is turbulent for the people and for you too. So you need to get to a level of permission. They want the people follow you because they want to follow you because you touch the heart before they ask for a hand. You talk to their hearts. You, they, you convince them from the inside out and then they say, wow, take us along with you. Example is Nehemiah. The third level of leadership, effectively, where you need to get to, is when you get people to follow you because of what you did for the organization. Now, in all of the things that I've been saying, where is Suki Sochi? Well, let me be like, oh, it, 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 it stays at position one. 
Saints are position, position one. But people that are going to make progress will need to have the gifting in order to be able to move to all these levels that we're talking about. So people follow you because of what you did for the organization. That is service. Because you are a gifted leader. They can see the gift. You are better. They see, wow, out of everything that we see around us, wow, you are better qualified. An example is David. Remember there was a time that some people said, David cannot become king. <laughs> He said, look, we have 12 tribes of Israel. Just take two because there's no way you're going to become leader here. And then when David performed and the service was excellent, it is the rest of the 10 people that came out and said, who was it amongst us that said David shall not become king? Production. The next level is people. When people follow you because of what you have done for them, service, in giving yourself out to them, in what you have done, you have encouraged them. Pastor Mike Ajayi was talking about a delegation. Some people don't even know that they can preach in the church until the pastor called them and said, wow, you're going to be teaching to them. I said, me, I'm going to tell them. And the pastor encourages them, enables them with everything that they needed, and they preach first time, and then they discover themselves. People follow you because of what you have done for them. You have encouraged them. You challenge them. You inspire them. You encourage them. You enable them. Jesus is an example. Paul is an example. If you are going to assess yourself, if you are a leader online today, can you tell where you are at the moment on this, on this scale? And the last one, when people follow you because of who you are, what you represent, Samuel is faithful. He lived a life of integrity, he was consistent. He, is a, he was a producer of leaders. When you become a producer, like you are, you are, you are bathing yourself. You are, you are, you are bathing yourself. You go to a, 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 a branch and, work, and you are bathing yourself all over the place. People that are confident, people that are able to lead again. That is when leadership has become you. I pray that the Lord Almighty will help us to move forward from our current level so that we can become a person that can influence our community in the name of Jesus. So moving on. Um, leaders become... Mm, I'm just checking my time now. Okay, all right. I'll, I'll be finished short, shortly. Leaders become great, not because of their power, but because of their ability to empower others. John Maxwell. Apologies. You know, I have, I have to... So changes begins with me. I have to be changed first. Instead of us trying to say, oh, my, my, uh, I, our congregation, they don't do this. They don't, they don't. Look at yourself first and change first. You as the leader, you as the aspiring leader, what are the changes that you need to make with yourself first before people can change? When we are changed, then others can change. If you don't change, others can't. Old ways won't open new doors. Go possible. So if we want to change so others can change, then we need to be ready to take the stuff that takes giants. All the abuse, all the things that comes with leadership, be ready to take it. Otherwise, maybe you have not been called into leadership. And then you need to work on your, on your personal uh, limitation. What are your personal limitations? Can you identify your own personal limitation that is not enabling you to function properly in the context in which that you have been called? In the context that we have been called to serve, looking at your environment, not looking at where you're coming from or where you are, but the context where you have been called to serve. And this is because you can't lead people beyond their leadership skill, beyond your own leadership skill. You can't lead people above your own level of trust. You can't lead, lead people past your own level of commitment. Um, one of my fathers, father said it earlier. I think the uh, pastor Yomi or Alagba Odu. Okay, we have two Yomis here. Or Alagba Odunaya. So you can't lead people around your own undisciplined lifestyle. Pastor Yomi said so. You cannot lead people without your own willingness to serve people. Don't say because I've been called to be to the position of leadership and then people are meant to be serving me. No, serve them first. So when you start wondering. Why do, people, why do people stop talking to me? I like this one by Colin Powell. Leadership is solving problems. The day soldiers stop bringing you their problems is the day you have stopped leading them. They have either lost confidence that you can help them or concluded 
that you do not care, either case is a failure of leadership. So if there's a problem in that area that people are not following you, I think you need to sort of really check yourself. Are you really offering the people following you anything at all? Now, if your action inspires others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. Definitely, you are a leader. So today, uh, let me conclude by saying this. We need leaders like Joseph. We need leaders like Daniel. We need leaders like Esther who can apply their God-given wisdom in the arena of public life. And people like Lydia, Priscilla, uh, uh, Aquila, who will exercise their Christian influence everywhere, able to step into the kingdom, in, in, into the king's palace, and you know, exercise that influence in order to change things. Uh, sadly, you know, uh, Pastor Yomi said it. The government did not even consult the church in the midst of a pandemic, how irrelevant have we become? And then we, stay so, we spend so much time in the church and whatever. Honestly, I don't know. The time to wake up is now. May God help us. Let me finish by saying this. Nothing will happen after these talks until you are exhausted and the pain of remaining the same overwhelms you than the pain of changing. I hope this hurts you. I hope this makes you uncomfortable. I hope this, all the things that you have had, makes you so unhappy that you say, I am not going to be like this anymore. I am going to change. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will help you as you make that decision. Thank you very much. God bless you for the opportunity. Amen. Thank you so much. We need to clap for all. Can you unmute, please? Can I unmute everybody to clap for all? Of God, they have given us so much. They have impacted us in so many Wonderful, ways. wonderful. Clap Welcome. I've learned so much. People, but we're clapping for the knowledge of God that have come through these men of God in our generation. I'm proud to be a member of this generation that is so impactful. And I'm only jealous that there were no women on this panel. So we, we believe that the, the God that is doing so much, <laughs> I am speaking for the women right now, that um, I believe that God has placed this men in our lives for a change for a generation. It is not just for today, but it is for a greater tomorrow because we are going to move in this direction. And I pray under the option of the Holy Spirit that I, Adekweju, have found a resource to move me forward into the next step of my life. And I believe there are so many people online tonight that will have a change in their ministry, a change in their calling, a change in their leadership. If I take a summation from the four speakers, Pastor Yomi Odunaya spoke about the future leadership. Pastor Mike spoke about the delegation of strategies for church leaders. Pastor Yomi Odukoya spoke about the expectation of church leadership. Mm -hmm. And Pastor Fakile spoke about the church future leadership in context. Mm -hmm. In summation of all this, there, there's something unique to each of those speakers um, Pastor Odunaya gave us a variation of the old, the new leaders and the directions where, where they have failed and where we need to see a common light, which shows that the character of the leader should be the same. It was said by all the four speakers. They all nailed it on that the character of the leader, it's a virtue for the next line of leadership. Say, show me who you are, and people can mirror you in the right context. Also, looking at the morals and the ethical values under the principles of leadership, that leaders, yes, they are ordained, but ordinations without miracle does not prove a good leadership. So what our father is saying within the quest of godly leader, uh, character 
that in every phase of the, of the life of a leader, it has to produce results. Also, that our leaders should have a teachable heart and mentality so that when they go through this journey of leadership, they do not just believe in hearing with years of anointing, with arrogance, according to Hosea 6 by Pastor Dunaya, that they need to internalize critical reflections in their missions and what they want to be flowing through the current of their leadership. He spoke about the current leadership, that they're not flexible, they're rigid, which shuts out the young generation from aspiring into the level of good leaders for the future. He says, whatever hands we find ourselves to do, we must do it successfully. Influencing others by a part of forward moving, respect that one iron sharpens the other. Finally, he says we should have a heart to serve. Not just a heart to serve, but a heart to commit into what we do. Matthew 20, verse 26. Churches need a lot of help today, and we need to have access to our leadership. Pastor Mike spoke about the delegation of strategies for church leaders, and he gave us five steps. He spoke about three basic things, authority, control, and attention, that leaders must be able to, be, be, they must be able to lose, that in losing authority to the young one does not mean they lose control over their members. Also, delegation brings attention. It allows you to focus. Also, he said something quite crucial, that, that there must be a collective responsibility in order to set up a good leadership scheme within any church. Also, that a leader have, has to be result-oriented. Also, he spoke about Adam and Eve, Adam, about the ability to do all things, but God dedicated some actions to Adam. So God did not do all things by himself. He used man to do certain things. He says the control of leadership is priceless if you believe in what you do. He spoke about something called the medication, which I quite felt intriguing. Delegation involves mainly authority from a higher level to a lower level. That giving dedication without releasing authority, it's like giving somebody tea without sugar. That's, that's my conclusion. Ensuring accountability, and he gave the reasons for dedication. That is biblical, it enables leaders to concentrate, it allows you to design every day from day to day and abilities to have potential leaders is to release strengths, abilities and potentials into the younger generation. Also, we have a Baba Ladra that spoke to us in terms of the selection of leadership and said, God speaks to leaders, they're guided by God and leaders need to submit to God. Man appoints, but God makes a leader, which is quite key from what our father said. Also, our father said, we need God constantly by our side and we cannot lead without God. Leaders are to be led. No condition is permanent because you're a leader today, you could be a follower tomorrow. So whatever you give, you must be able to receive in lines of leadership. That you must not lead without a blessing because God watches how you lead and God sees what you do. Our father, Dukoya, spoke about the future of leadership. He spoke about the character, that the character of the leader is solid because it stabilizes the church, and it is evidence of a good character that forms the foundation of any good church, that you cannot achieve beyond your boundaries because your character will undermine you, that under pressure, your character will reflect who you are, and this could either break or make you to lose your level of leadership. And he told us what leaders do. They support, they mobilize, they direct. They allow, they support the structure and whatever you get through the expectation of leadership is to exemplify through the words, action, lifestyle, qualities, values that will let you encourage the members 
he spoke of the voluntary, uh, voluntary followership of their vision, which is through the words and their lifestyle. Also, he says, serve consistently, provide to the people the work that is only done until a lot of inside of you is emptied out. That you cannot do things when you're full, but when you're emptied out, you need to work until you get to the stage where you empty out. He says, continuously and consistently serve with the expression to aim at providing a benefit or adding value to those that you govern. Also, he spoke about the inspiration of developing sound principles and living by exemplary values, which helps to maximize the potential of members and mobilize the resources that you have. It says also combine a deep sense of purpose and intense passion for people and commitment. He spoke about moral principles in the delivery of service and why people are leaving the church, showing the right value. It says consistently exhibit a standard of integrity and conduct that reflects the trust and responsibility placed on the shoulders of leaders. Also, he says all these are not negotiable. If you're struggling with causes, this is why a lot of churches are failing. He spoke about the church leader, who do they, who are they responsible for? The word, God, other churches, the government, the young people and the church members. And he categorized them according to the values, how the government has not seen the church as an amplified body, whereby we have no remittance or impact to the things of the world because the government do not see the value of the churches. And he spoke about the young Christian expectation. We need to listen to them. We need to show them the change. We need to guide them. And they need to see that through our exemplary conduct. What other churches expect from us? Cooperation, prayers, credibility. And finally, he says we must not break promises because this will simply erode the road of downwardness and for the untrust that we will not become trustworthy in all that we do. Then finally, we have our father, Kule Fakile, who spoke about the church leadership in contest, using the stories of, story of a, of, a, of a man of God that went to India and spoke about the sun, how the people perceive it in terms of their culture and how they could pace and relate that the words of God sometimes needs to be relatable in terms of the contest, the delivery and the environment where we share the words of God. Finally, he spoke about the leadership, the authority, whether they are formalized, whether they're given to an individual or to a group, the pace at which we give it. He compared uh, the leadership that we have to the leadership within the, in the African context, how we can revolutionize this into the context of today's generation. How effective is it? Call to leadership. He's, he gave a reference of Acts chapter six, verse three men of honest reports, that it is not by sun kin sun or move by move, that it is not the title, it is not the glory, but the, what is desirable is for you to become the last so that your qualification is relevant within the presence of God. Also, he said call to leadership should be by calling. He gave examples of Moses, Abraham and David by recognition through the gift of God, by apprenticeship, through training. He said, and he said by service, and he gave the example of Elisha, who was mentored by Elijah, Samuel through Eli, Jephthah through service as well. That a leader of the church has money to build a church building and not building the people as a casket in waiting. So finally, he gave us the five effective leaders, leadership by right, permission, production, people and parenthood. Leadership access yourself, you should, you, should access, you should assess yourself on what skill you are at the moment. Change begins with me. I have to be changed first. And that is a message from all the four speakers. Now we can go into our questions. I hope I have been able to put the summation together to the best of my knowledge. I would ask for questions. We have, the time is far gone, but I'm sure our speakers are still ready to answer, to answer questions to the best of their knowledge. Please, if you have your questions, feel free to ask our speakers. And I believe that you will have more in-depth knowledge in terms of your inquiries. God bless.
Pastor Emmanuel, I, yes. I, I will hand over to you at this stage. Thank you, everybody. Um, as my auntie is prophetess, as gladly said, um, if you do have questions you want to ask our speakers, please do raise your hand. Or if you don't want to raise your hand, you can write the question in the question box and I will read out the questions over for you. If it's possible to do everything in the next 10 minutes, hopefully, even if less, due to time, we all have church tomorrow morning. Okay, if that's the case, and they would normally say in Daniel Ban, Tiko Basi. <laughs> so um, first of all, before we close up, um, I would like to say a big thank you to everybody that turned up to today. I have a question if there's no question. Who? Pardon? I my uh, name yeah. is Pedro Akinolu. I have a question. <laughs> Okay, Auntie <laughs> Um, With all that have been said tonight, we, I think, majority of the people online tonight are from the CNX set. And I want to particularly ask that in uh, Pastor Yomil Dukoya was, was part of us, and I believe he's still part of us. Amen. Um, the, if I look at the leadership structure within CNS, it is really sad to tell that the, the direction of leadership in terms of the succession and in terms of the opening for the next generation to come is quite steep. And the only way that the younger ones can have a voice is through breakaway. And I, I, I start to think within me, how more, how much more of this are we gonna accommodate before we realize that the genuity of the, of the service that we have, it's eroding away. Not just, within, not just only within the CNS, but within Christendom. Because we have a lot of our children go to university, they come back and say, hey, I'm an atheist now. I don't believe in your church. I don't believe in that God you serve anymore. So if we're looking at the structure of just the leadership within our church, I think we're, we're not seeing a vision of tomorrow because the, the vision of tomorrow, it's in our children. And the leadership structures that we have now does not compound them that they can fit into any structure tomorrow. And if we lose them out of, if, if we allow them to wash away from us, it becomes a problem for us. What direction, how can we hold our youth to maintain the values that we have? as Christians want, two, in terms of the leadership that we have today. Like my younger son will say, the other two will come to church and the last one will say, I don't understand what you guys are doing because I don't see what you guys tell me that I, I need to understand beyond what I've been told outside. So where is the direction in terms of our leadership culture? Uncle Fakile, <laughs> would you like Why to do your love? <laughs> you and Pastor Mike are the ringleaders. Pastor it's a very it, it's a very uh, important uh, question, and I think uh, if I, I wonder why this session. Is only for today because I've been, you know, I, I said earlier that there's no way we can finish this lecture today because I can see some question being posted online. Yeah. This is where the real business starts. We can talk so much, but when it comes to what we're experiencing, what, what people are experiencing, how can they deal with it? I can assure if I ask people, if people were open enough on this platform, if I say how many of us have had our children come to us and say, Forget it. I don't want to do this God thing or church thing anymore. You will see hands go up. And I can tell you, because it's a reality, I have spoken with parents, not one, not two, not three, not four, within the CNS that are going through this. Because the church has failed 
to meet the need of the youth. The very first thing that is a big problem for the church, for the youth of today, is our hypocrisy. The life we live in the church, the life we live, or the kind of life that we portray to the church or on the pulpit is different from our life, our real life. Everybody is acting. And our youth cannot cope with that hypocrisy anymore. One. Number two. Do you know that my, my last born is... Uh, ah, Fakle, you put your, your, your feet in it now. Okay. My, my last born. Now, if I... You know there are times that if I want to talk to Judah, I find myself so inadequate to communicate with him on certain matters. I will have to ask either Joba or Tani on that matter, discuss with them because they kind of relate with my own reasoning now. And then I'll say, communicate with, jo with Judah. And then they will come back and give me the expected result. Let's take it back to church. Again, we're talking about contest. We have leaders that are not speaking in the context, in the reality of time and space. And they are just bored out. People that have no calling to be in leadership are the people that are in leadership. People are bored out. And, you know, we have a generation of youth today that they speak out, the Sorosoke generation, <laughs> they will speak out. You know, there is a time that you keep them and they will just be waiting. Ah, I will be 16 soon. I will be, ah, I will be 16 soon. The moment they hit that age or they go to university, they exercise their right of disassociation because we are not meeting their needs. So these are the problems that we have. We put people in position to become the youth leader, to become this and that and whatever. And the church will not invest a dime to train them. And then we condemn them for not doing what they, they ought to have done. Let us invest in our leaders. And when you feel that you, the, you are out of your, whatever, your, your, your depth in leadership, let the people know. Go and get people that are resourceful to help. It is not failure to say that I can't do it. It's, let me finish by saying this. You know what pains me? You know, in those days, I would have said, in those days, I have some certain things on this platform today. In those days, I would have said, Yes, that's it. I'm no longer. I'm no longer be. I'm no longer going to be a member of the CNS movement anymore. But I think I've now realized that wherever you go, you will be the same problem. And let me tell you, when you take the piece of your leadership, you take it too as a priority against the peace of the people and the salvation of the people. Wow, that is bad. That is bad. When you're not concerned about the welfare or the well-being of your people to be led properly. But because you wanted to maintain peace in the church and so that there will be no problem, whatever, and those people can be led into hellfire. It's painful. May God help us. Amen. Um, I can read another question from one of our sisters. Um, I think it's Sheyi Bella. She said, we have a great insight with everything everyone had said tonight. But well, something I was hoping to hear about was that is about the leadership style that is more appropriate to the CNS church. Is it auto autocratic or democratic? Is it a combination of that or what? Pastor Yomisa, we had the discussion about this earlier on. Would you like to enlighten us? There are two Yomis here. Uh, Yomi Odunayaza. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, again, once again, good evening, everybody. Um, it's been mind blowing. I wish I could say so much because my heart bleeds, really. God sees my heart. Hmm. I don't know where we're going from here. I've given all my youth, I've given my life to the ministry, 
but what has this ministry given back to me? But glory be to God, who is too faithful to fail. Were it not for God, where would I have been? I, I, I can't place my hand on my chest and say I'm a product of any functioning, any proactive leadership in the movement. But it's just the, the, the working of the Holy Spirit because the Lord chose and then he places the blessings upon those he chooses. But let me say this to, to, to you, my fathers and mothers, men and brethren. It is such a shame that there's so much divisions in the church today. Nobody seems to care. You know why? Because when one breaks and becomes two, two breaks and become four, some people somewhere are deluded. They are seeing that as growth. Ideological differences, difference of opinion, you know, things that naturally shouldn't be a problem. You know, if only we will come together. Now, let me say this to you. Autocratic leadership is not fit for any organization, either corporate or, 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 or Christian. So that, let's take that out of it. Relationship must be seen to be symbiotic, mutually beneficial, but that is not what you even have. You see, look, when you look at pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, people, people's hearts and eyes of understanding have been enlightened. And thank God to technology. Imagine we're all here. I have people on this platform that, that are called in from Canada, from United States, from all over the world. And isn't that the, what the Great Commission is all about? But let me share this to you with you tonight. People perish for lack of knowledge. There is inadequate or gross, I don't know how to put it, of knowledge, knowledge gap, skill gap, management gap in the movement, because that is my own primary constituency. I won't say much of the redeemed of mountain of fire and all that, but one thing I know is missing in the CNS is we give credit to such useless things like titles or the nations. And look, it's not going. Let me tell you something. Wake up, wake up, smell the coffee. That is not where the future of the church is not in titles. Ephesians 4 11 said, God gave us apostles, prophets, and the teachers, evangelists. He didn't give us any, there's no such, I mean, prefix to it, senior, special, most apostle, trend. those things don't matter at all. And I keep asking us, where did we get these things from? These things, look, when it gets into people's heads, it makes them feel unnecessarily bloated and they, they tend to begin to drive personal inordinate ambitions and they, they, they tend to forego the things of the, of, of the spirit. Otherwise, how would you say you are leading and your followers are not, they, 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 they not acknowledge it and you are not bothered? It is only in the movement that I know people will say, oh, no, 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 you walk on a long way. But have you forgotten that it takes two, three, four people to build a church? A church is the coming together, an assembly of faithfuls. The church is not about one person. Nobody holds monopoly of wisdom. Even as parents, aren't we supposed to, 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 to care for our children and not to cause them? You understand what I'm saying? To be hungry. That's what the Bible says. But you look at it, look at the church today. We're still in the movement, for example, we're still talking about, is it proper for women to preach on Sunday? Is it proper for women to do this? But it's proper for women to contribute tithes. It's proper for women to pay money. It's proper for women to help you build church. But it's not proper for them to teach and to use their God-given potential, talents, gifts in the ministry. And the Bible says a man's gift is, you know, you know um, what do you say? Open up ways for it. I mean, look, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are still, we are still back in stone ages. Ministry, things of the kingdom, had since moved beyond personal ambitions and um, unnecessary, 
what do you call it now? Sentimentalities. We need to call a spade a spade. Let's preach the word. Let leadership be sensitive to the word, to the things of the kingdom. Learning is a, is, is a continuum. The moment you stop learning, you die. So whether you will like it or not, we shouldn't be scared to delegate and let go. It is not just enough delegating, you must also let go of it. That is not what you have here. Rather, you, even in your, in your quest to want to help to build the church, you are seen as wanting to take the church. Where are you taking the church to? And like I keep saying to people, I have a church in Nigeria. There is somebody there managing that church. I've not been there in two, three years. And yet somebody would want to call me leader of CNS movement in Ibadan, Nigeria. Are you not deceiving yourself? Can one man serve two, two, two? How can you, how do you serve two positions? You will need to eradicate some of those things that have been necessitated by the love of money and the love of positions and power. Even Jesus Christ, one person, led his disciples. He didn't call himself all sorts of names. There was no title to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ didn't answer to Apostle Jesus Christ. We didn't call him Prophet Jesus Christ. If you don't call some of our father full title today, you will enter their black book. So, in this case, what can I then say? Because I've been pondering on this. Is where do we go from here? Because one of the reasons why I didn't want to attend this forum is, look, we say all this, say all the words, we preach all the gospel, yeah, but it doesn't go out of this place. I believe we should have a communicate, you know, raising from here to the desired offices so that they know that this is the mindset, this is the thinking, that is the vision, this is the mission. How do we get there? How do we get there? This is not about me, it's not about you, it's about the future of, of the church. And do we have kingdom-driven, kingdom-driven leadership? Kingdom drinking, I'm talking about kingdom-driven leadership. People that believe in the things of the kingdom. People that are not driven by their personal ambition. People whose human you know, agenda is not what is driving what they are doing. You must appreciate the fact that, look, sometimes accountability is the first law. You want to lead, but you don't want to be held accountable. You want responsibilities, but you are not ready to take the authority by the book. You want to lead. You want to be seen to be leading, but you don't want to be led. Look, let me tell you something. Except a man, you understand? Come oh up to agree that servant leadership is the future of the church. Any successful, any thriving organization must imbibe the servant leadership. Serve so that you can be served. And, and let me say this to you. Any home divided or a house divided against itself cannot stand. Schisms in the church, in Christianity, is, has led us to where we are. Oh, there are more than 45,000 denominations globally or oh, in Christianity. Why? 45,000? Why? Within the movement alone, we have the independent churches, we have the modern churches, we have modern parishes, we have the district one, district two. All of them, let them come together. Are they up to one congregation that should function in, a, in a, the whole of Europe? What will happen if the whole six districts in Europe come together to worship under one roof. What would happen? How beautiful would that be? To worship in the beauty of the holiness of God. Not having, not, not having you call yourself Paul or Apollos. And then we are serving the same God. And this is what I stand for. I've always been looking at it this way. That look, even if at the conference, we shouldn't be holding Horeb conferences and all that. Let us hold word conference. When I say what, I mean W-O-R-D. What? Let's talk to ourselves. Let's celebrate the world. Let's celebrate Christ. Let people begin to live L-I-V-E, the word of the Lord. Sometimes you look at what you've been through, raising your children, and what most of our fathers and mothers on this platform are doing to raise the youth, to give them the power, to give them the voice, the legitimacy they deserve, and how some of our so-called leaders water down the effort. It is such a shame. Thank but you know what? But in everything, we should just give God the glory because he knows the end from the beginning. And you know, one thing is, is this. 
Let me submit and, and close this way. He knows the end from the beginning. And the Bible says the end of a matter is always better than the beginning. So I want to believe that the journey we have started here will definitely end somewhere. Okay. And we will all give glory and honor back to him who is worthy of our praise. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I, I think <laughs> one of the final questions that we have tonight is that somebody just sent a message that we uh, the world is about movement. And if there's a movement that we need to keep progressing, that where are we going to progress? As my father has just said, where was the next stage from this gathering? Um, people are asking that they want something that is formalized, that needs to move to the next stage. And I think there's so many observers that have said the same thing. So we want to ask, what is the next step? I know the convener might not be able to answer this question, but I will leave it in the hands of our mothers online, our fathers online. We are in a generation where we can speak. We're in a generation where we can give our thoughts. We're in a generation that it matters to me because the future of my children and the future of the next generation is something that I care about. And I believe that we need to speak and we need to be heard. Pastor Fakilesa. Thank you very much. I just want to sort of uh, offer one or two uh, suggestions with respect to how do we uh, move this on because usually we have a lot of talk in most cases and uh, we don't know exactly what what is going to uh, lead to and then next year again we're going to be having something on leadership and then we just take it and nothing happens i i want to suggest and it's not that i have a prepared whatever but as you were speaking a couple of things just came to mind um thank god for the life of uh, the covenant co covenant of this uh, event uh, uh prophet uh, um emmanuel I think with your current relationship with people in leadership, I think it might be a good idea if we have a two-tier kind of, uh, I'm not sure if, it, if I can call it some kind, kind of academy on, on leadership, but past experience of uh, some people in leadership that feels that, uh, you know, they are there, there's nothing that anybody can teach me now about leadership, you know, some people that are set in their ways. I think that can be a stumbling block. But again, I say that so that I can prepare you for the kind of uh, obstacle that you're going to meet. Um, so it would be nice to actually engage them. Maybe we can uh, kind of find some kind of a forum for current leaders, current leadership, whether district chairmanship, uh, district uh, branch leaders and whatever, and create a forum for them whereby it can be maybe a monthly thing whereby they come together and we can try and learn from one another. But we need to be very careful so that it, it is not seen that these small boys are trying to teach us because again, you have to massage their ego at times and uh, you, you know you know, you, you, you know it and that's the truth really. So you might need to get one or two of them on your side in order to and the way you can probably do that is to try and get one of them to come and share with us why they do things the way they do it so they are part of the process and then we can then rub on them as well to say okay these are things these are examples and whatever that we can learn from people that are in leadership and all that so that's one tier the second tier that i i i, I think might also work is that there are a lot of people that are frustrated with leadership they are frustrated there are members that are committing some grave error and sin because of the frustration of leadership and um i think i don't know maybe it's therapy that needs to come in first <laughs> <laughs> or we should just ignore the therapy. Honestly, I'm, I'm telling you, there are some leaders. Okay, shut up. All right. <laughs> but you know, forget the therapy. But I, I think we need to sort of have some, some, some. Uh, is it halfway house that I call it? So a, a, a kind of a, a, a system in place whereby we can accommodate people that are on this platform and youths all over the place that are going to take the role of leadership tomorrow and begin to mentor them and begin to share uh, information with ourselves. Okay, if this is a situation, how can you take on leadership at this particular time despite the fact that you're having this? But most especially, we need to concentrate on the youth, I think it will help us so much. Because, look, I, I'm saying this because it grieves my heart. 
because when Pastor Jai was saying something, I put something that I said, those even, even the, the delegating powers to the oncoming one should also be taken with a pitch with, with caution because past generation had already bathed a carbon copy of themselves. I see some youth that are in leadership now, young boys, are in, they are worse than the people that put them in position. So maybe we need to address them as well. Maybe we need to actually look at the community. Maybe we should just forget about our generation and maybe concentrate on the ones that are coming behind so that, again, maybe they can build these falling uh, fences. May God help us. That's just my own thoughts about how do we carry this forward. But I'm sure that other people, like by, uh, Pastor Yomi is there, I think, is into this kind of stuff. It can help us as well uh, on, on what we need to do. Thank you very much, sir. Um, the time is 10 o'clock. Yeah. Uh, uh, Prophet Emmanuel wants to speak. So yeah, I'm sorry. I had to just, you at this point. So there was just one person that um had their hand up quite a while. Um, Auntie Funke, if you're still online, I don't know if you're still there. Um, okay, she has logged off. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, I would just like to say a big thank you to all the speakers, but first and foremost, I would like to thank God for the inspiration and the opportunity. And second of all, I would like to thank my dad who is online. And because, you know, that we spoke when we read about Ephesians 6, it says one to four about you putting your children in the discipline of God. And I just thank God that from right a young age, used to sit down next to uh, my father and just look at him do so many church activities, the programs, man in the church. Um, obviously as well, when he was the district secretary, when all the district was still one body, you know, he's, all, he's had a big impact in my life. And also I want to thank, thank people like Uncle Kule Fakile that's known me since I was a very wild person. <laughs> And my auntie, my prophetess, she my mentor, tells me off when I'm good, when I'm bad. Auntie Peju, and um, Pastor Mike, our daddy, you know, and everybody on the platform. Um, and lastly, the only thing that I will say, there's been so much, there's been so much information and pain shared today. One thing that I've learned in ministry is that you can't do things by force. The only way out is if you speak and speak to somebody who doesn't work, take it back to God. There is so much, there is, there is not, there is nobody that is above um, God. You know, at times you can make noise and make noise. And sometimes that noise turns you into a nuisance. But when you cry, the Bible says the secret place, that secret place is the place where you and God can have that one-to-one -one conversation and you trash out all your, all your matters. How many of us deeply sit down in our homes and actually pray for our leaders? I'm, I'm sure a lot of us do not do that. Leadership is a very, very, very difficult position to be in. But I pray by the message of God, God will deliver us. And like we said on this platform, Today is the beginning of a new thing. I believe to myself that this is not ending here. But for me, it's not ending here. I said, Bereni. So if anybody is ready to join us to create godly war, let's go ahead. But I just want to say thank you and God bless us. Um, I would like our father from America to just give us a closing prayer. Um, the district chairman for the USA district, our daddy Gabriel Kazim. Praise the Lord. Praise, praise the Lord. Hallelujah, sir. Hallelujah. Do you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you, sir. Yeah, before I pray, I just want to thank every one of you. I listen to you. And uh, I appreciate every move you are proceeding to take. Psalm 86, 11 says, teach me thy way, O Lord, that I may walk in thy truth with my heart to fear thy name. 
definitely we understand that uh, there's a need for change, but people don't want change. And we cannot avoid it because it is God's will. And uh, the presence of the youth is our tomorrow. Therefore, we need to put them on a solid rock so that uh, they will not stumble. Everybody who has to do the presentation, may God bless you. Amen. Father, we thank you for today. We glorify and honor your name because it is through your ways that you have been called. Because the Bible says that it's those who that you are predestining that you are called and those that you call that you are anointing. The position of a leadership is your way because nobody can be a leader without being your call. Today, we want to bring all our leadership worldwide into your able care that will continue to direct us in the pride of righteousness and teach us that way so that we will not mislead those people that are following us. As a leader, we know that uh, there are much that have been given to them and much is expected from them. It is you, O oh Lord, that you can speak through them, that you can direct them. Jehovah, we have today, as we are looking for the future, the glorious one, through the means of the youth, that we continue to establish them according to your way. As leaders, we pray that we continue and be able to practice what we preach, mm -hmm. to be a good example for those people who are coming behind us, mm -hmm. so that your work will continue to progress and the propagation of your words will be to according to your will. Mm -hmm. Today, we want you to establish us that we continue to progress in all this meeting, and the youth that are joined together today, oh Lord, we pray that you energize them. Amen. Do not let any of them stumble on the way. Amen. Amen. They are working for the glorious way and the future of the tomorrow of the CNS Church. Mm. Father, in your name, continue to empower them. Amen. As we start today, oh Lord, let us see the end in a glorious way. Amen. May your name be glorified. Amen. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, Amen. the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Amen. rise and abide with you, Amen. rest upon you, continue to direct your way. Now or forevermore we pray. Amen. 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 In Jesus name. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And thank you. Before we go, before we go, please, um, we're just going to run a poll. And just to ask for feedback, it's just going to take just one minute. Perez, if you can just quickly click on the pause and quiz. He's just, he just asked us a few questions. If you can please just quickly just answer the questions so we'll be able to know what to do next. God bless us all. Perez, please press the pause and quiz. If you're there. Um, sorry about this. Yeah, I can't submit. Has the post come up? It has, but it won't let me submit. Just you need to just press submit. Yeah. <laughs> is is everybody know. having the same problem? No, no, I, no, I was I've submitted. I've submitted as well. Oh, perfect, perfect. If you are if you are co-host, you're not going to be able to submit. Right. So, submitted. Well, anybody else should be able to. Even that, I, I've been able. To. Oh, I've been okay. able to. Okay. Okay. Find strange then. You want me to submit? <laughs> Answer all questions. Yes, mommy, I tell yes. you, thank you for a wonderful job. Thank oh you. yes, absolutely, yes, yeah, you did a wonderful job, yes. Mm -hmm. Well the best broadcaster we have in the UK, please. So for all your events, please call her. I'll be her, man <laughs> her manager. Her manager. Question, but she does it for free, isn't it? It's not yeah. free. We have calling out fee. 
She's yeah. very generous. She's a very generous woman. She's a very blessed <laughs> family. She's a wonderful prophetess and moderator. And yeah. even the daughter is a wonderful singer and everything. The whole family is just blessed. Thank you. God bless. <laughs> you. Sure to function. Don't forget, she's an amazing yeah. cook. She's an amazing decorator. Can you imagine? She's an amazing <laughs> person that shows prayer gown. Whichever style you want, be, our quality is your poor girl. Ah, we need to talk about that one as well. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you so much. God bless you all. In my face. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Thank Good you night. so much. God bless you. Well done, everyone. Good night. Good night.